Hello, and welcome back to the Game Match Podcast. I'm your host, Manny Friedman, along with my co-host, Brad Sloan. Back in the house, baby, for uh, another preview pod, mega pod. Yeah. Yeah. But first, we have to congratulate Manny on the uh, cashing the, on actually having the guts to place the two one rude bet in the semis versus Djokovic. <laughs> we talked it up. Like I had the idea, we talked it up, and I just stayed conservative. I mean, I, I put it to you. Yeah. Honestly, it wasn't that bad, but I stayed conservative and played just the rude the rude money lines. So I was like, oh, Djokovic might just come out sluggish and play the whole match terribly, and yeah. So I was kind of yeah. I, I, mean, I was I happy know. to I, take I just felt like... I'm always happy to cash a two to one money line better better. Oh, it's but... great, especially as a dog. That's what I'm saying. Like when you catch a two a plus one hundred money liner as, as a dog or yeah. better, like you're never sad. That was slightly disappointed that he put a little money on that two one. That was like six to one. Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice payout. I mean, I, I was following your advice and going with a dog two one. You know, like that's uh, that's something that you actually taught me. Yeah. So, um. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I understand when the dog is already two to one. It's like you know, just hit that just in case he wins two zero. But against Novak, you know, there's going to be a response. You know? Yeah, I guess. I guess. I haven't been as big on Novak. <laughs> um, I know. I know. Well, wait, it's good yeah, he didn't win the good. tournament. Because... And honestly, like, I guess that's a good place to start. So, like, like and he's the best, the best guy. Like, he's the only guy that's not playing. Ironically, like, a lot of the big guys are playing this week. So, three of the four yeah. semifinalists, or at least as of right now, playing this week, and I think they will, all three, um, are playing this week. Um, so, but Djokovic is not, obviously. Well, Sinner isn't either. Oh, he was a semifinalist. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah. yeah. The so semifinalist, Rude and Sissy Pasquale. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I guess we can start with Djokovic. You could start with Djokovic or Sinner. Yeah. I thought it was a good week for Djokovic. Like, I, honestly, I thought it was a really solid. Like, I think, like, if you're Djokovic, this is a really good, good result. Well, it's an improvement from what he's done in Monte Carlo in the past, right? In the last couple of years. And it's a Marcus massive improvement Bokina. from Indian Wells. Yeah. That's true, too. That's true, too. But so, I. I think I think Djokovic has to be like borderline. And look, he was competitive with. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could even argue played better or played at least on equal terms with a top five clay guy. In you yeah. know after the showing he had had year to date, and after um after the showing he had had year to date, and how poor he usually is at Monte Carlo. I think he's got to be like if I'm in Djokovic's camp, I'm delighted with this. With this, I mean, you know, like I, I get it. There weren't any big wins. Like the biggest win was Musetti, but I'm happy to chalk up three wins and get a semis appearance in in a in Monte Carlo. I think that's a great great result. Yeah. He looked like he didn't look the, great, but he looked at like at the same passable. time he's at the same time he's getting older, right? And like, how many times? How many more times is he going to be able to? work his way into peak form going into a you know into Roland Garros you know like is he going to be able to do this year after year after year like there has to be a point where you're not going to be able to do that right yeah, but at that point he just loses and he's just done right like I don't think like this is a bad like yeah you know, I, I don't at this point he's not he's never going to be shooting for master's titles like he might he might win some master's titles like like i don't know i want to this is such a bad way to say but like he might almost like back into some master's titles you know what i mean just by virtue of like okay he's at the event he's going to try but like i don't think at like, this point like the the goal for him is master's titles i mean yeah i i would agree with that it's just like I don't really buy into that narrative as much. Like he enters a tournament, like he tries to win it, you know, it's in his hometown. It's, it's an event that he cares about and he likes, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, he seemed plenty motivated. I don't think that that was, I don't think it's a lack of motivation. I just mean like Monte Carlo was an event that like, he usually doesn't do well at. So this is better than, you know what I mean? Like this is a, I think this is a, a positive result for him. Well, I think it's good for him that th th there's no 250 in like Banya Luca or, um, you know, uh, Belgrade. Belgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, where he kind of, I think he's like signed a deal or something where he had to play that, right? Like, the fact that it's in Bucharest and he can take this week off and get ready for Madrid and Rome. Like, I think that's, that's good for him, you know? Like, yeah, probably. Probably. Although, like, so. I mean, honestly, he's at the point where he could just play the 250 and skip, uh, skip madrid too right like that's uh, yeah like, that's true like that's he's true. reached that point where he basically plays when he wants to right 
Right. But overall, good week out. I was a little bit concerned about him from a, a physical perspective because, like, I felt like after long rallies, he was gassed. Like, he lost a lot of long rallies to Rude. He lost a lot of long rallies to Demonur. Um, I don't know if this has to do with him working his way into form because, like, I guess if you remember last year, like, in uh, against Musetti and in, as well in, like, Banya Luca, like, he, he was struggling. Right? Yeah, but he, he had the arm issue back. I, I'm more like... But two years ago, remember he gassed out against Volkina? He gassed out against uh, Rublev in the third spot. Yeah, third, so maybe, maybe, it is, I mean, maybe it's a thing where he needs to work his way into form and into the long rallies after. I don't know. I don't, I'm i not... Like, I, I think it's... I get it. Like, it's not perfect by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. But I think it's a pretty darn good result. Like, I think it's, it's okay. way above, like, where I think anybody could have expected him to be. So, like, I guess putting it into context, I think he's, like, plus 225 to win the French. Like, do you think that has value now? No. I mean... I actually, I actually think it does, because, um, like, with Alcaraz question marks, like, I think that he probably should be the slight favorite to win the French right now. With with maybe I just Spain. don't think any I, I think it's wide open enough. I don't think anybody should be less than like four to one, five to one. And I know that's not how it works in slams, but like I don't think there's any guy who's separated themselves right now. But you can kind of bank on him to kind of work his way into form, right? Like uh he's, kind he's of, but the Australian of Open years. he then laid an egg in the semis. Yeah, but he's never done that at uh Roland Garros. Yeah, but but okay, but there's still, but then there's you've got Alcaraz out there. And yeah, there's question marks, but I don't, I'm not that concerned about the Alcaraz injury. Oh, um, I am. I you know, am. I mean, it, it could become a problem, but he's got six weeks. Like there, there's quite a bit of time. I'm not I'm not going to make a play on Djokovic yet because I think Alcaraz is hurt. Um, Sinner is still a threat. I know he physically. I, I, there's still a lot of questions there with Sinner. He he failed the test this week, but I'm not. Well, we could I'm translate that. We could um, transition to him, like. He failed the test. The, the one question mark that we had on him was answered and he got an F, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He failed the test. Uh, I mean, but you made the good point that like Monte Carlo might actually be the toughest physical test in the sport right now. I think so. Well, with, with how, with the masters all moving to two week masters, like I think so. Maybe Paris indoors, like if you're playing like late at night, and then you. But that's a quicker. I guess that's tougher from like the the weird turnaround times in the Paris indoors. Yeah. But the um. The clay. But the but the, I mean, and slow clay, right? Like these are long rallies at Monte Carlo usually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you know, and again, like it's so. I think it's. I, I yeah, I don't, I don't think it's been answered. I mean, like, I I think it's been answered in a negative way. Like, the physical issues cropped up again, right? Like, it did, yeah. And like, if he has to go five sets in at Roland Garros, like, I don't know if the kind of the 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 cramps were due to the rune match and then the wear and tear leading into the sissy pass match, or was it more just a singular incident? You know. You'd have to hope it was a, it was it was a long match with Rune leading into a match with Sitsipas. You'd have to hope. You have to hope right. that one three set match doesn't burn him like that. I mean, geez. Yeah, because if it's it not does, good either way, but if it does, then you have to kind of fade him at the French because like I still I think, think it's bad either way. Because what if he has to play a five set with the French, and what if that theoretically right. is over two days? Like, I don't know. What it was cramping, right? Wasn't that the issue? I think they were putting the cream on that seemed to indicate it was a cramp. It could have right. been like a strain or something. It looked like a cramp. You know, they were they were they kept putting that cream on. So I think so. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, that being said, he should have he should have won that. That was a horrendous call on that that double fault by Sissy Pass at four one break point. Yeah. I mean that was terrible, and then like that wasn't even close. That that wasn't was even horrendous. close. That was horrendous. Horrendous, horrendous. And on top of that, it happens to be the hardest call for a play. I mean, you know, for being a tennis player, like that's the right. hardest call in the sport to make when you're like when you're the returner, like as a player trying to call that ball in or out. Oh, impossible! I usually give the the player the benefit of the doubt because, and then like the the opponent sometimes just says that that was way out. Why were you hitting it? It's like I couldn't see that, you know, like. 
from that angle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I uh Yeah. So I don't blame Center for playing the ball, but it, it's on the lines person or the ump to check that mark. And like I thought if it's out, even if he plays it, like they can they can overrule that, right? Because like that should be the end of the The chair ump can overrule. What? The chair ump can overrule. But he didn't go and he didn't even go and check the mark. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I look, I, I, probably, I, I don't know yeah. what happened there, but like that, that killed my minus four. I mean, that, it just, it was terrible. And if, if center is up two breaks, like Sissy Bus is not coming back. Right. Yeah, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. I think it was quite oh. a, quite a bad call. Um, and, and yeah. quite a, you know, and, 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 and honestly, like, so I always liked, like, I don't know, like we, we have this debate all the time. I like to try to give the tournaments the benefit of the doubt um, and say, okay, well, you know what? Like I, I, on the, on the clay, you can check the, the mark. So like, you know what? It probably actually makes sense to, to have the, um to have the umps actually go out and check marks and do it that way. But then you see stuff like this and you realize like, no, these umps can't be trusted. Like theoretically yeah. it's fine, but like they can't be trusted to do this. Like they need to get the electronic line calling in because 100%. like, the ums are complete, like they're just disasters. Like in every it's it's just so frustrating because like I feel like we see it on like a on basically a weekly basis in the sport where like yeah. the ums are just like horrendous. But I also feel that since they have electronic line call, like during most of the other tournaments, when they actually do have to call the lines and check the marks, they get lazy. Because in other tournaments, they know that like they have the uh the technology that they can fall back on, right? Whereas like they're not used to this now, you know? So I, I also don't like the inconsistency of it, you know? I agree. So I, I think like, I don't remember like back in the, you know, 2000s or like late 90s when they had to call lines all the time. I don't remember this kind of uh, like incompetence, you know? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that was terrible. That was, I mean, I guess there was, there was incompetence, right? There was like the whole Serena Williams Capriati incident, which was like just utter incompetence. So like there's definitely been incompetence in the past. I don't think we can say there's not been incompetence, but like, yeah, there, that, that was, that was terrible. terrible. The Garin Borges incident was terrible. Like there's been a few just like, just terrible, like just, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like just really, really bad. One of the best refereeing um, incidences I've seen in tennis in the last like year was that, I was actually just scrolling through Instagram and I saw this. It was the uh, the Tiafo uh, Rayonich set. Yeah, point. the one where Tiafo hit the net outside the post. That was, yeah, that was yeah. great refereeing by that guy. Yeah, and he knew the rule. Ferg like, Murphy. On the spot. Yeah, Ferg Murphy. Fergus Murphy. He didn't have to do yeah. any research. He didn't have to ask anyone. He knew that rule, and it was it was awesome. Like I'm like, way to go, buddy. Like. When do you ever see good refereeing like that anymore in any sport? Yeah, no, that that I, yeah, I mean that yeah, that was that was impressive. I mean, we we called that on the podcast. I remember talking about it, like for like a half hour. Yeah. How great refereeing that was like it was great, but yeah, that was that was disappointing. That said, like I guess I'm still glad that we saw that like Sinner like that it was good. It was good to learn that Sinner isn't quite there yet physically. Yeah, I mean, I, good I learning. Agree. Like I think there is definitely there's like a. There, there's a learning there. Um, and he's I guess getting he's better. Not, I'm, I'm not saying... about it quickly because he's in. The, I'm sure we'll talk about Sitsipas more, but like, good week from Sitsipas, man. He looked, he looked good. He looked I mean, good. when's the last time you saw him look this good? Um, probably at the French two years ago. Okay. Uh, well, no, two years ago he actually lost to Rune, so maybe not even. Maybe it was three years ago, in like 21. When he made the final, he was two sets up on Nova. Yeah, right. I mean, he looked really good. I mean, this the slow courts really help him, um, especially on that backhand side where he has a little bit more time. Where you know, he's not like rushed. So I have a slightly different take. I actually don't think his backhand looks that good on any courts. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's more that like his forehand is so good. It is. It is that like he can hit through any court in the world. Yeah. And that's very true. Uh, and his yeah. transition game to the net off that forehand is in incredible as well, right? And that's actually probably the part that's better. And he can hit yeah. it so many different ways. 
Like, and then at net, he's so long and so big, and he has a great overhead. Like, where do you go? He's a fantastic no? overhead. He, you know, he made several really good overheads in this tournament. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I yeah. I think like. Yeah. He's just. He's. When he's right, he's so good. He is, and then I. I also think like with the backhand, if he just loops it back deep, right, and doesn't like really hit through it, but just kind of loops it back deep. It's a more effective shot on a clay court than, uh, you know, than a hard court. I agree. I also think it's like. So he can manage that weakness slightly better. I also think it's like good enough. You know, like his backhand doesn't need to be that good. Like his game should, you know, his game should be get backhands in the court and not short so I can set up my forehand. Yeah, but also on the clay, he has, you know, since it, the ball loses speed after it bounces, it just gives him also more time to run around it. Well, that. I was going to mention that. I was going to call that out. That's a great call out. I was going to call that out, but you beat me to it. I agree. Mm -hmm. So he he ha just having those extra couple split seconds just enables to hit him to hit so many more forehands. And he's so good when he runs around it, man. Again, <laughs> like when he when he's when he gets to hit an offensive forehand, he's so good at that. Like so good. I mean, it's kind of like Nadal, but like from a, as a righty almost right like nadal has a better backhand and yeah and nadal defends a lot better like there's a lot of things right. nadal does better than sitsipas or nadal yeah. in his prime did better than sitsipas there's a reason why sitsipas has zero french open titles and nadal has 14 <laughs> but you know right but it's kind of that similar kind of game right when, when he had when he's on the front foot on that the foot. offensive piece is very similar where he has a really good yeah. neck game really good overhead 100 percent, yeah and it helps his defense too, the clay. The, the, the it help, yeah, I, I'm not going to say it doesn't help his defense. It helps his defense. Yeah. I just think, like, he still made plenty of bad backhand errors this week. Like, it wasn't like he's all, it wasn't like all of a sudden you saw that backhand get, like, cleaned up. I think it was more just that, like, it did, it matters less. You know, he's able to work around well, a little better. And yeah, he makes more, he makes less per shot or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was surprised that he ripped, he ripped a few down the line. I mean, but, you know, he does that. On a hardcore too, right? It's just like yeah, occasional you know rip winner, but um, yeah. yeah. Overall, I'm I'm very pleased. I I mean I'm pleased to have another guy in the mix. You know, like that's what I learned about this week is that there there are multiple guys in the mix, and I think we have a clear top five. We have oh, I don't think so. That's interesting. Well, so I think okay when Alcaraz comes back, he's obviously there, right? You got Djokovic, yeah, Sinner. Yep. You got Sissy Poss and you got Rude. And I think those five guys have separated themselves from the field. In okay, terms I of disagree. Like, in I terms disagree. of like who we can trust going into the French, like as legitimate title contenders. I disagree. Okay. Um I agree with all those five, but I think in addition, Rune has to be in there. Um Okay. Yeah. I, I get he, it. You can't trust him physically to get through a match. And I get it. Like he can lose either. to anybody. And then those are two massive problems. But he does so well against top 10 competition that I think he has to be like, especially on clay, which I think is his best surface. And, and like he has all the tools. It's just a matter of like mentally and then like physically getting through the match. Um, I know he's, I, I, I he's like the most easy guy to dislike on the tour. I get it. But, but like I, I he's been good against top guys, but when when has has he beaten a top guy in a slam? Besides Sissy Poss, like at, at the French in the third round, but that that was like a very poor version of Sissy Poss. Fair. Like, fair. Fair. I mean, he lost the last two times to to Casper Rude when I think like it was like pick a mods like last year. Yeah, he's been quite bad in slams. I, I I don't disagree with that. He plays top guys tough in like Masters one thousands, but then like in a slam, he 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 has he's never won one of those big matches. Well, it's a pass. Yeah, that's really the only one I can point out. And that was before Rune was a top ten player. Like he was a big dog there. So now yeah. the expectations are higher. You know, and he's been a top ten guy. I mean, that, that that is his only top ten win in a slam, which I guess is fair. So I that's why I can't fair. put him in that top five. Like, I agree in terms of talent, yes, but 
I can't trust him yet. So I think those five guys I mentioned are still a tier above. And then the other guy in not this exact week, but I think Rublev's up there. I mean, he's probably a notch below those five, but I don't think he's that far away. And I know I probably, I'm probably more of a Rublev guy than you, but. I like Rublev, but I, I also think he's just struggling now. Like, I think he, he's a guy you can actually fade now. He's okay. been bad for like quite some weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I don't, I, I guess that's what puts him not in that tier because like he is, um, because he is, um, I mean, like you more, can, to your point, you can fade him against like, yeah, he's so limited against top guys. Like Rune has the weaponry to beat the top guys if he's mentally there. Whereas yep. Rublev is always mentally there, but he just doesn't have the game to beat those top guys. And I think the difference between those two guys is that Rublev is just not good enough in the forecourt. You know? Like, yeah, I think, very I think that's true. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I'd put him a notch below. I think you're right after thinking about it a second time. I think you're 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 right. I think, but he's not far off. I guess I just wanted to mention those two guys. I think those two guys are are not that far behind. Mentally, he's better than Brune, but like in terms of game, I don't think he's like he's he's a to me he, like Rune is a distant six and Rublev is a distant seven. That's how I put it. And then probably Zverev is close to Rublev, maybe a little bit in front of him just because like he's been yeah that was the eighth guy i was gonna mention is where does Zverev fit because Zverev is i mean in a slam i put him slightly ahead of rublev just because he's proven to make semis before you know yeah he, he has a little bit more to offer in terms of like playing the forecourt and just like overall game but i mean those guys to me are clearly seven and eight Okay. Okay. I, I I get it. I get it. I think mm -hmm. it's. I don't know. I feel like. You know, Zverev occasionally has shown up and beaten those guys, though. Like Zverev has done pretty well against Alcaraz. Um, I don't know if he would have beaten Nadal, but he was right there with Nadal the in the match he got injured. Like he was right there with Djokovic the match he lost to Djokovic in the semis. Like, I don't know. On a clay court? Well, the Nadal match was on a clay court. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. But I don't know. How how much better do you think Zverev is now than he was last year at the French when he made semis and got absolutely demolished by Rude? Yeah. You know? like Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. It's, it's, it's always tough with Zverev because he just like... He has those duds. Right. And so it's hard. I feel like it's hard to judge him because like his level is actually not as consistent as you would think. It's not. It's not. You're right. Yeah. But like again, like he's had again, not I mean, some on clay, some not on clay, but like he's had some pretty good results versus top guys. But then he's had some. Huh. You know, like he beat Sinner at the U.S. Open. Yeah, that was more a physicality uh, issue with Sinner, though. Like, I think if it, I mean, if it was Sinner in this year's form, I think he gets through that, even with the heat and all that and the humidity. Maybe. You know? Maybe, but, you know. I mean, a good win, but, like, not... To me, it was kind of an outlier just because of like the terrible conditions, you know, and the center physicality. So I don't, I'm not putting too much stock into that. Like to me, that's not a reference, true representation of like how good he is, you know? I get it. And that's fine. Um, I don't know. I just think he's, I don't know. I, I. And where does Medvedev fit in all that? <laughs> Well, I think he's he's below. Okay, I would agree with that. Um, on a on a certainly on a um. So do you put like who do you put a um, who do you put ahead of each other, Dimitrov or Medvedev? 
Oh, on a clay, oh, on a clay court. It's a good question. On a clay court, I put Medvedev ahead of Dimitrov. I mean, I don't love either of those guys on clay, but I think like I think Medvedev is a much better tennis player than Dimitrov. And I mean, Dimitrov um, went seven six against Broom, and that could have gone either way. That was a very high quality match. Yeah, but Rune, I don't know. I hear you. I hear you. I mean, maybe they've won Rome last year. Yeah, that's true. I, I did right well now, Monte Carlo I put last year, like... slightly ahead of Medvedev. Slight. Okay, I I wouldn't, but I I hear you. Okay. All right. So that does it. Well, I, in a way, I mean, I'm not a huge Sissy Pass fan, but like, and I faded him a lot this week, which was which was a mistake, but um. I'm just happy we have him in the mix. Like, like if he's there and he's a big threat to, you know, to win, you know, or get yeah. far in yeah. the front. I mean, how open. much in the mix is he? I, I think it's interesting that you said he was top five. I mean, I get it. On clay, I yes. You. On slow clay? Well, I mean, you have, you have to put him I mean, ahead probably. of he was, he was He wasn't bad last year either with the exception of the Fritz match. You know, he just got killed by Alcaraz a bunch of times. But right. You know, Alcaraz was was at a really, really, really high level last year. Like, let, we have to know. That. like that's some of the best clay court tennis I've seen from almost anyone, with the exception of Nadal and maybe Djokovic at the French occasionally. You know, like yeah, that was a really high level of tennis. So, I get it. Yeah. All right, so let's tra transition to the three tournaments. Uh, yep. This week. All right. So yeah. We got. It's I love these three tournament weeks. It's amazing. When we, when you have multiple tournaments with like multiple features yeah. and all that, it's it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Um so let's start with uh, Barcelona. So um as far as conditions goes, it, it's pretty slow. It's very it's very slow. It's like, I don't know if it's Monte slow? Carlo slow, but it's pretty close. So like what are the slowest clay courts in the of the year? Like Monte Carlo. Umag. Buenos Aires. Yeah, I think this might be as slow as Buenos Aires. L let me look something up a second. So, uh, because they have measurements for these things. Um, I'm looking at some of the measurements that are out there. I mean, Nishikori um, sent out an email. Yeah, very slow. It's the third slowest in the last couple of years. Only Rio, Buenos Aires have proved to be quicker. Slower. Uh, slower. That's right. Yeah. 65.8% points won on the first serve. 70.1% service holds. 0.24 aces per game. And 0 0.09 tie breaks per set. And that's the stats of the last two years. Yeah. It's no, it's definitely. So it, it, it yeah. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, that's fair. I think uh, the last few years it's definitely played slower. Um, yeah, it's it's one of the. I mean, look, whether it's it's very slow or very very slow, it's it's slow. Mm -hmm. Um, so weather wise, it's pretty cool, right? Seems like pretty good conditions to play. Mid sixty. I think it's pretty good. I think it's just pretty nice weather in general. Like the weather is supposed to be um Mid there's some wind. There is oh. some wind, so that's something to Correct. watch out for. But otherwise it's in the sixties and seventies. Potentially some rain midweek, but not like not a ton of likelihood in the forecast. Mm -hmm. It's pretty solid conditions. Okay. It's good. Yeah. Um in terms of the tournament itself, uh this tournament's been dominated by Rafa Nadal. He's won it 12 times. Yeah. Um, other guys who have won it, Nishikori twice, Verdasco, team. Um, it's almost always won by one of the top seeds. Um, so it's, it, it, and it tends to be a clay kind of grinder type, with the exception, I guess, of Nishikori, who was maybe more of an all quarter, but team won it once, team beat Medvedev in a final here one year. Alcraft was the champion the last two years. Um, yeah, finalists even tend to come out of those top five seeds. There's been a few unseeded finalists, but tends to be a top five seed. 
Mm -hmm. um so that that's a couple things um but i'm not buying too much into that just because it's all it's been alcaraz and nadal for the most part right like um i mean but he but but the years that they weren't in it uh a team as a um i mean team team was a top three clay quarter you know well, that's but that's the point it's it's a top guy like this yeah. gets a pretty good draw so it's almost always a top guy that wins it Mm -hmm. Like the only, I mean, it's been a top five seed the last 15 years or the last 15 editions. Okay. So I think that tells you, like, if you're picking an outright, you better pick a, a, a one of the top guys. Top guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um so the other thing like... I was looking at here, which I think is fascinating mm -hmm. is I was looking at the over under stats. So over under 22 games, specifically in the first three rounds, um, it tends to after the once you get to the quarterfinals, the tendency has been for it to become a little bit more even. Um, but in the first three rounds, um, the there have been in the seventy nine completed matches in, uh, in the last two years in the first three rounds, mm -hmm. only twenty two have gone over twenty two games. Wow! And seven have gone to, have gone exactly twenty two games. Fifty have gone under the twenty two. So that's like 65 to 70 percent have gone under the 22 games. So there's so a you, massive if just, trend towards under. If you just blindly play unders, we will probably come in profit, right? Yeah. And the other trend. interesting thing is 58% of the sets in the last two years in the first three rounds have gone under the 9.5. Wow. And okay. usually that's usually you're getting something here like close to even money on that bet. Well, it's like minus 110. Usually it's something, yeah, that's what I'm saying, close to, and if it's two play, like, closer guys, a lot of times it'll be, like, plus 105 or plus 110. Like, usually it's something close to even money there. So mm -hmm. for 50, I mean, 58%, the break even in there is, like, minus 140, minus 145. So yeah. probably more like minus 140. So, like, given that you're usually getting at worst minus 110, not at worst, it varies a lot by match, but you're usually, I would say on average, you're getting somewhere, somewhere, Certainly better than minus one twenty on the under the under nine point five. Um, I think that was a pretty interesting trend as well. But my my um strategy or like one of my bets this week, I'm gonna do two parlays each day. I'm gonna do one under twenty two and a half parlay, and I'm gonna do one under half a tiebreak parlay. Yeah, I think that's pretty like, great. Of like five or six legs, and if I hit like one or two of them, I'm I'm in big profit. You know, so yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I'm going to do. I mean, I hit two of them last week and, you know, one was like 17 to one. One was like 10 to one. Yeah. And like, you know, that basically put me in profit for the week, you know? Yeah, I think it's a pretty fantastic idea. So that's that's definitely what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to do that for every week at, in the clay court season, except with the exception of Madrid. You OK. Know? And then obviously for the French, it's best of five. So you kind of have to, you know, like think differently but um yeah as far as these best of three events go i think uh that's that's a good strategy because like i was checking the the under half a tie break odds and most of them are like minus 200 minus 220 like obviously i'm not gonna do it for like a huge no but that's if you're getting minus 200 to minus 220 that's a darn good deal i oh, mean yeah. given the tie break stats we just gave out yeah if you i mean like a lot of these matches, if you're getting better than minus 400 for under half its tiebreak, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic play. Oh, yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I yeah, I was looking at it. So in the first seven. three rounds in the last two in the last two years, um, there have been there have been 13 tiebreaks in the 79 matches. Okay. Wow. That's that's a small percentage. Very small. Yeah. So like my under half a tiebreak parlay tomorrow is Arnaldi Cazo, Diaz Acosta Rincon, Kotov Offner, Saf Safilin and RBA, Muller RV R ARV, Hart Landaluce, and Mayo Kachin. And like no tiebreaks in those seven matches. That's 14 to 1. Right. Right. So I mean, it varies between like plus two hundred plus 200 and plus 250 i think let me get i mean up. minus 200 and minus 250 yeah, yeah, i mean that's right. pretty amazing like that's pretty amazing given the stats we just gave i i 
I'm definitely looking to hop on some set one unders, whether it be no tie breaks or under 10.5s or on, you know what I mean? Like, but definitely unders are the way here to go. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I'm um, just looking at the odds for the under. So like Koto Offner under half a tie break is minus 189. Yeah. Moeller ARV is under two is minus 220. Yeah. Land Luce is minus 220. Arnaldi Cazo is minus 220. So like it's not for me, it's they're great parlay pieces. They're fantastic parlay pieces. I Maybe mean, they're great single bets. It's like however you want to bet it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like me, I mean, it just depends. Like, I know you don't get excited about a minus 220 bet, but like, and that's just not enough like to get you excited. So like I think it's whatever you like to do. Like right. Right. I think they're just fantastic bets, period. Mm -hmm. And then I have six matches where I'm just doing the under 22 and a half, just kind of blindly almost. Yeah. Um, not guys yeah. with big serves, but um, you know, just like I'm doing Arnaldi Cazo, Mayo Kachin, Hart Landaluce, Safulin RBA, uh, Muller ARV, and Kotov Ovner. I'm just just putting the under 22 and a half together. I mean, those you could do a single because they're all minus 110, you know? Yep. So, yeah. All right. So let, let's get into the draw here. So um, we got, um, so. Alcaraz is out. You should do the printout. Marjan's taking uh, that spot. Yeah, Marjan is in that spot. That's what I was going to say. Um, yeah. Pathetic ATP. They haven't even updated their website. There's the draw starts in like five hours. Like, come on. I know. I know. <laughs> so we got uh, Van Ash against Zhijian Zhang. Diaz Acosta and Rincon. Uh, winner of that match will play Korich. Lorenzo Mazzetti will play the winner of Hugo Grenier, Lucky Loser, and RCB. Uh, Pablo Kotov and Sebastian Offner. Um, will, and the winner of that match will play uh, Sissi Pass. So uh, this quarter, I mean, the unseated guys for me, like none of them really have a chance. I think Zhang is always dangerous, but like between Sissi Pass, Musetti, and Marajan, like I think, you know, Marajan is always a dangerous floater, no matter where he is in the draw, right? And then like, I think Musetti and Sissi Pass are two of the tougher guys in this field. Yeah. So I was so excited. When this draw came out, when mm -hmm. I saw that Marajan took the seated spot to see what his quarter price would be, and I wanted to hit, like to hammer Plus something at, like a forty to one, eight to one is terrible price for Marajan. Like he's just he could lose any of those matches. I know, I know. And then I was so sad. Like Zhang I was like, tough, that's a tough uh, first round match. If you he plays Zhang, yeah. And I think this is a surface transition for him, right? Because he's coming from Miami. Didn't Zhang play last one of the past two weeks? No, That's Zhang did. did. Uh, Marjan, I mean. Oh, yeah, maybe Marjan didn't. I don't remember. He also might have just lost so early. I don't even remember this point. No, he's coming direct. He, the last match he played was Mike. Okay. So, yeah, he hasn't played on clay yet. So, um, yeah. I'll probably back off. I think he's actually going to be more dangerous in Madrid. Oh, I think 8-1 to one is a terrible price. There's no – I have zero interest in Marjan at 8-1. to one. Like, that's, that basically makes him a coin flip all three matches and, and – like at 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 best he's a coin flip, and there's no way he's a coin flip against Sitsipas. Like he could play great against Sitsipas and get hit off the court. Like yeah, for sure. Let me pull up the futures here. Yeah, Bovada actually has quarter prices up for once before the event started. <laughs> so Sitsipas is plus one forty, Musetti is plus four fifty, um, Korich plus seven hundred, Marjan plus eight hundred, Diaz Acosta plus eight hundred, Van Ash fourteen to one, RCB fourteen to one, Koto sixteen to one, Zhang twenty to one. Um, I mean, I actually have Sissy Pass to win this event at plus three fifty, um, or three twenty five. I'm back in that trend where you know you said the top guys usually win this event. Yeah, and he's gone from Monte Carlo to Barcelona, and like. It, it's been a good transition for him in the past. Like he won, uh, I think in 21 and then he made the final and lost a three and a half hour match to Nadal. Yeah. Right. Uh, last year. I mean, if Alcaraz didn't get him, he may be, you know, he may have done well in that event. Like, so I've, I've gone from a, I've gone from like completely fading Sissy pass to like 
being a pretty good sissy pass backer. Like I was really, really pleased or impressed yeah. with what I saw. We can talk sissy pass. So, and I I agree with everything you're saying from a qualitative perspective. And I completely agree. If there's somebody on the tour who I trust to to go and win two events in a row in two weeks, it's sits a pass. Um, yeah, Physicality is not really an issue with him. No, nah, and he plays short enough points. It's also not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of under notice there that he plays. He plays, he doesn't really play long points. You know, his, the way his game is. Um, I, I think plus one forty is a decent price in the first quarter. I think three twenty five is. I, I can't get behind a three twenty five price there. Not okay. when you've got. I know. I know he beat the crap out of Rude today, but now when you've got Rude, Nadal, and Rublev in the draw, I can't get behind a three twenty five price to win an event. Um, and then on top of that, I, I I'm a little like we haven't seen like the burn. I, I guess last year maybe Sitsipas was burned out, you could say, but we haven't seen a burned out Sitsipas play well two two weeks in a row. Um. But I, I get it. I mean, it makes sense. I just, I really, like, I actually, I saw M Bet MGM, I think, had him at, like, 450. Okay. And I thought that was a that was probably a pretty, uh, I, I, I might have gotten behind him at 450. I think 400 would, in my mind, is more of a fair market price. I get yeah. it. I think it makes sense to have him as the favorite. I just don't love the price. Like, in order for me to get on guys that low price, I usually need to think they're they're head and shoulders above the other guys. Um, I, I mean, Rude's still a top five guy. I don't think he's that much better than Rude. I just don't think Rude, for whatever reason, played well in the first set today. And then um, Nadal's. I mean, I'm not like I, I'm not I think that's a terrible all. price on the doll. What? I think that's a terrible price on the doll. Oh yeah, yeah. I can, I can never bat Nadal, but I'm just saying he's he's in the draw. And then you've got Rublev also, who like I get it. You might you don't. I know you're meant you're fading him right now, but like he's still like this is still a tough enough draw where to back somebody to win five matches in a row in a three set match at three twenty five. I I can't get there, especially with, like Musetti's in there. Like Musetti could theoretically, he's probably going to have to beat Musetti in his quarter early on. That could be a roadblock. I. I I hear you. I, I like what Sissipas yeah. did. Well, first of all, I think Musetti, that's a great matchup for Sissipas. Like, I don't think Sissipas will have any problems in that with that matchup because, like, Musetti doesn't really take the ball early. He doesn't really force you into defensive positions. And I think Musetti's ball will actually enable Sissipas to attack. And Musetti also doesn't really take the net away from you. He, he likes staying back and just kind of running side to side. So I think that that's, that's all fair. I just don't think that like that that's all fair from like a, a matchup perspective. I just yeah, he's like, a tough guy in the draw, but I you I start kind of just summing up the the percentage chance that guys have to beat him, right? And like I think Musetti has like I don't think Musetti would be a favorite. I wouldn't pick Musetti against Sitsipas, but like I think there's some chance, right? And like the same is true of okay. Rude, the same is true of Rublev, like. I just think there's like too many roadblocks here that that could trip him up for 325 to be a good price. Like I said, I think he should be the favorite. I just think 325 is too short of a price. Okay. okay. Makes sense. Makes but it's sense. not like massively, it's not massively terrible. I just think it's like, you know, I mean, look, like you're saying you think he's better than like 25% roughly to win the event. I'm saying he's probably more like 20. It's not like insane. Okay. Okay. I, I actually prefer the outright price than the quarter price because like I think on clay he's better than all these guys in that in in the third quarter or in, no, in the second quarter and then like i'm fading rublev here we saw against kachanov that's a terrible matchup for him um i mean if rude gets there that, that's you know that's obviously tough um but like i just don't see anyone like i think he should be where he is like i think it's a good price so i i get it i get it um I just I I like if you compare the quarter price, I should think the quarter price. I so I actually disagree with. That. I mean the quarter price is a, it's a better deal. Um okay. basically that quarter price, but like the quarter, if you just do the math on it, like the quarter price, the, the, the math between the quarter price and the the outright price is saying that since pass is like like well over 50%, close to 60% likely to win the event if he makes the semis. I hear you. He's the best guy in the in the field. I get it. I don't know, man. Like, 
it's so are you are you hitting anything not a, not in q1 i, th I think no. since is a decent price there i think that's probably like so my, my, my other thing on since is like i said i'm a little potentially worried about mental burnout like I, I think if like a fair market price on just pure tennis on Sitsipas is probably plus one thirty to plus one thirty five in Q one, but when you factor in like burnout and you always have like the random chance of injury, yada yada, like I can't really get behind it. Okay. But in Q one, it prevents me from hitting anything else. Like we talked about this before. Like in general, I think if the if the favorite is close to fairly priced, it makes it really hard to hit anybody else in a quarter because the book has to take vig somewhere, and if they're taking vig off the rest of those guys, like. Yeah, I mean Zhang is down there at twenty to one. I guess that's sort of interesting, but he's got to win four matches and like yeah, no yeah, it's, it's tough. It's actually a tough draw for him. Yeah. No. Yeah, Zhang and uh, Van Ash, and uh, I mean I think he should be a favorite against Van Ash, but then you have to play Marjan, um, Korich, and then either Sissy Pass or Mizetti. I mean, yeah, twenty to one. I mean I think that's that's just about right, but like. I would, I mean, what are his odds going to be against Sissy Pashang? Well, that's the thing. If he's even money against Luca Van Ash, so we're previewing this already. If he's even money against Luca Van Ash in round one, you could probably just, like, he actually might make over, sense yeah. as a rollover candidate. Yeah. I'd be interested to see what his price is in rounds two and three. He might be a better rollover guy than a quarter guy to back. Yeah, because, um, oh, my God. <clears throat> Yeah, because I think he's going to be a dog against Marjan and then, you know, against Korich, I mean, or Diaz Acosta, I would back he's him. Probably, he probably ends up being a slight dog against Korich, probably a favorite against Acosta. Probably. Um, but the thing is, like, if you get him through to there, like, he's probably a, he's he's a massive dog against Sitsipas. Like, you'll get him at least 300 or better, and if you want, and he's a dog against... uh Musetti as well. I don't see anybody like play him. Anybody else making that quarterfinal besides Musetti or Sitsipas? Although that might be a good matchup for uh, for Zhang if he play, ends up playing Musetti because he beat him two and zero in Doha. I mean, I understand it's it's hard versus clay, but like, yeah, it's no. I think it's completely different conditions. Yeah. All right, next quarter here, um, we got um, Demonor. He'll play the winner of the Kaboli Nadal match. Uh, Altmeyer and Poppy, our guy Poppy. Um, the winner of that match will play Arthur Fees. Then we got Davidich Fokina. He'll play the winner of Machak and Shang. Schwartzman, who qualified, will play Dusan Lajevic. And the winner of that match will play Ugo Umber. So as far as quarter prices go, we got Nadal at plus 200, which I think is ludicrous. Um, Demonor at 4-1. to one. Umber at six and a half to one, Fokina <clears throat> at seven and a half to one, Machak at eight, eight to one, Feast at eight and a half to one, Poppy at 12 to one, Live at 16 to one. Um, and then we got, yeah, the long shots. So uh, I actually have two plays here. Um, okay. I wonder if we're going to be aligned. Do you have a play here? No, I, this, this quarter sucks. Like the problem is like, I mean, it's fascinating from a tennis perspective, but crappy from a betting perspective is what I would say. So I, I'm actually really excited to see this from a tennis perspective. I think it's fascinating because I think there's, I legitimately think there's. See, I disagree. So, so since I think the doll is so overvalued here at two to one, like to win a quarter, like he hasn't proven that he can play like two matches in a row. There should be value somewhere. I just don't know where it is. Like, there's, I think there's eight guys who could win this quarter. That's the problem. So, to me, I'm back in the two Aussies. I'm back in Demonor at four to one, and I'm back in Poppy at 12 to one. So, like, these are really slow, and it's like there is some rain in the middle of the week, and it's like, and I think it's going to be a little bit heavier than, um, than Monte Carlo. So, like, because it's cooler as well. So, like, the fact that it's like, it's not cooler. much cooler. It's pretty similar on the temps. The, the temps oh, were in the Monte 60s. Monte Carlo was in the 70s. It was 60s and 70s. This is the same for Barcelona. But I think there's one day that gets in the 80s, but it's not. Okay. It's 60s and 70s this week. It's, it's pretty similar to Monte Carlo. Like, I think these are good conditions for Poppy. And Poppy has to play Altmaier, which I like his chances. Then Fies has been in pretty bad form recently. I mean, he... Played a tough match with Mazzetti, but like I'm not 
like high on him right now. Um, I mean, obviously Demon Orb, but I'm backing both guys. So like, if they end up playing, that, that's that's fine if Demon Orb wins. I'd rather have Poppy win as he's a better price, but like, they're playing each other, and then you can't trust Bokina. Um, Lyavik, I mean, he should theoretically be good in these conditions, but he lost the first round of qualies in Monte Carlo pretty badly. So I, I don't know about him. Um, Folky Brain and then Umbera is tough, but like, I don't know, Slow Clay is, is not really a guy that I want to back, especially at six and a half to one. So um, I'm going with the two Aussies here. Plus, Demon Orb made a semifinal run here, and he had um, Alcaraz down match point a couple years I ago. I remember that was two years ago. I remember that. So, I don't know. That's that's where I'm going here. So, I, I guess my argument against that would be: I think Poppy, like number of matches, is a big deal versus price. Like last week, we had him at forty to one. That there's a there's a I get it. He had Rublev in his draw. The draw looks a little better this week, but. 40 to 1 versus 12 to 1 is a massive difference. Well, he had Novak too. Fair, fair. I I just I I four matches for Poppy at 12 to 1 seems seems tough. Like okay. you know, especially if like he's gonna have to play more than likely either Demon or Nadal. And like I get it, maybe Nadal's not physically there completely, I think but like Nadal, that's There's... a good matchup for Poppy. Because like he's gonna he's gonna pressure Nadal's movement. Maybe. I mean it depends how well Nadal's playing, right? Like yeah. you know, I, I it yeah, and that, that's the thing too, is like we just know nothing about Nadal, so that makes this tough. Um I hear you. Demon or four to one, I think is decent. I think it's it's decent, not great. Um, I actually think that's, that's that might be an okay price, Demon Art four to one. I'm not gonna hit it, but that might be a decent price. Well, with Poppy, and the reason why I'm hitting it is because, like, I think he is equal to these three guys, to Fokina, Machak, and Feast. Like, I don't see any reason why he should be, like, you know. No, the players. reason he would be below Fokina is because he has to play an extra match. That, that, that okay. would be the reason there. Um, yeah, I'm not, I think he's probably a little undervalued versus the market but you got to factor in the vig i have no idea what a looks like uh -huh. i get it I, I hear i hear the logic on poppy i just i i, I just would want a better price okay i i understand um it's and just like i said i think and, and what it comes down to is even if we say nadal can't win this quarter i think Lyovich could win this quarter I think Popperin could win this quarter. I think Makach could win this quarter. I think Fokina could win this quarter. <laughs> I think Umberic could win this quarter. I think Demonor could win this quarter. A lot of guys can win this quarter, yeah. Yeah, I got actually I think Shang could be live here too. I'm not hitting it 33 to 1 because I and I don't trust him physically to get so many matches on clay, but you know, I, I think there's like a lot of really fascinating. I mean, Kaboli's not terrible. Like, there's a lot, like this is a really like even quarter. And like I just Yeah, yeah I, I can't. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, but I can't get to any of these guys on the prices. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the bottom half of the draw. So we got um Sebi Baez. Um, he'll play the winner of Arnaldi and Cazo. Uh Ajukovic will play Trungaletti, two qualifiers, and the winner of that match will play Nico Yari. Then we got Jordan Thompson. He'll play the winner of Wame Munar and Yoshi Nishioka. Then we got Alexandra Muller will play Albert Ramos Vinolas, and the winner of that match will play Casper Rude. So I think this is a very weak quarter. Um, I'm actually inclined to hit Rude here. So I disagree that it's a weak quarter. Okay. But I for me, Casper Rude is a multi-unit play here to win this. Really? Quarter. That's 130. Yeah. Like who beats him? Who beats him in this quarter? I mean, Yari has proven to be a tough matchup with him. That's the one guy. That's the one guy, Manny. I, I agree with you on Yari. That's the one guy. That's the right answer to the question. But nobody else. Yeah, that's it. Bias is gonna get smoked. 
<laughs> just like yeah, the only play uh, two fifty, and he just he just took against Scroof. Arnoldi. Arnoldi, I guess theoretically could maybe beat him. He's got a nice kind of game to beat him, but I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, he's too erratic. Munar, no chance. Thompson, no chance. Ramos, no chance. Muller, no, no chance. Kazo, maybe. I, I have never seen him play on clay, so I have no idea how he does on clay. Duje, I mean, not. I doubt it. Maybe. You're not Yoshi, worried about no the, the rude Kazoo, burnout. No chance. What? You're not worried about the rude burnout. No, he's done fine in the past, backing up titles and, and winning multiple titles in a row. On clay. Yeah, but he also played Esteril. You know, so he's played he's played two weeks in a row now. It's a fair point. I'm still not worried about it for a quarter. I'm more worried about that factor in a in an outright. I'm less worried about it for a quarter. I think he's even done the triple before, hasn't he? Hasn't he won one he of has. the play triples? Yeah, but this, yeah. But last week was a it, it was a tough week, you know, beating Djokovic and like he played late against Umber. I mean, uh, I don't know how much it matters for this week that he played late. No, but it's it was a tough week. It wasn't like an easy week, you know. That's what I'm saying. You know, to make a final of a Masters like that, that's that's a tougher week than than one of the two fifties, you know. Fine. I'm not worried about but, it. You know, there's no guarantee that Yari makes it there. That's yeah. the point. Like, he's going to smoke Muller or Ramos Vinolas. He's going to smoke Thompson, Munar, or Yoshi. Like, Yari could easily, Yari isn't, isn't that good on slow play. He could easily lose before that. Right. Like, to All me, right. that's GBM worthy. Let's GBM it. All right, nice. We'll GBM it. All right. Um, last quarter, we got Karen Kochnov. He'll play the winner of Roman Safulin and uh, Bautista Agut. Uh, Harold Mayo qualifier will play Pedro Kachin, and the winner of that match will play Cam Nori. Then we got Tomas Martina Chiberi. He'll play the winner of Nick Hart and Martin Landaluce. And then the winner of Dan Evans and Brandon Nakashima will play Rublev. Um... I, I don't know what to make this quarter. I want to fade Rublev, but like I don't know who to fade him with. That's what I'm struggling with here. Um, if we look at prices, Rublev is plus 220, Tachina plus 325, Nori plus 550, Echeverry plus 600, RBA 8 to 1, Nakashima 10 to 1. And then we got the long shots. Um, I'm curious to see what you have to say because I'm having a tough time here. I don't have anything on this quarter. But in terms of outrights, I've got Rublev here at 10 to 1. And my logic is that I think Evans or Nakashima should be a get right spot for Rublev, like the classic get right spot. And I don't think Etch is that bad of matchup form either. Like Etch has a big forehand, but the but like other than that, like he's he's not really that good off of both wings. If Rublev wins two matches. His mental state should be a little bit back. And I think as a pure, not on clay, but I think he's just a pure player. He's the best player in this draw. And he's 10 to 1. Not on clay necessarily. I agree with you. He's a he's a dog against Ruder versus a boss on clay. But I, I he's a dog to root on clay, honestly. No, I, I Ruder sits upon. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Ruder said he's a dog to Ruder sits upon clay. I agree. But I think at 10 to 1, like, I mean, look, like, I, I, I said, I, I think Root is GBM worthy as a quarter pick, but I think it's 50-50 he gets beat by somebody. Like, he's got to still win three matches. And Rublev is a massive favorite against anybody else in that Q3 if he makes the semis. Um. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he's in a good little section to get right, right? Like, like... Those guys really can't hurt him, whether it's Evans or Nakashima or Etch, right? Like, I mean, Etch maybe could. Like, I, I could see Rublev finding a way to lose that match, but I don't. I don't think so. And like, it, it's it's not that I love Rublev this week. <laughs> I just the ten to one price to me seems pretty good. Yeah. 
There are rumors that um, Nadal beat Rublev 6-1 in a practice set. I know, like, we don't care about practice. But... I'm slightly concerned about that, actually. Like, I, <laughs> I like, more so, like, it, it's probably the practice set. If, if, if I can, it's probably, the, like, the most, like, in, in the history of practice sets, it's probably the most concerned I've ever been about a practice set. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm fading Rublev, so I can't get there. I I just don't have a play on this quarter because I I don't really trust Kachanov. I I don't think he's in quite as good form. And then I guess that six to one six one practice set is kind of weighing on me too. <laughs> like, and again, that's why I I don't like Rublev in the quarter. I like him as an outright pick because like okay. this is like if he if he if he can if he can, if he can get right, like. 10 to 1 is a good price. Like, I think it was, in a lot of ways, it's similar to the Sitsipas pick last week. At like, whatever it was, like 15, 16 to 1. Like, yeah. You know, like, where, yeah, he's been, like, Sitsipas have been dog crap for a year. But, like, if he can get right, he's got this, he's got the skills. And I think uh-huh. Rublev is kind of in the same. That's interesting. That's good logic. That makes sense. 10 to 1 is quite, it's not quite good enough, though, for me. Okay. So, yeah. All right, let's go to the individual matches. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So, ah, this is the match I wanted to talk about. Uh, Evans versus Nakashima. Evans is a three-game dog plus 170 on the money line. Uh, Nakashima is minus 210, and the over-under is 22 and a half. Um, so, what's your play here? Yeah, so uh, so here, here's my thoughts on this match. I... In terms of Evans is uh, so in terms of like this match, like I think these guys are should be pretty even as players. Like Nakashima, both these guys are better on slow play than you think. Like Nakashima's results on slow play aren't bad. Like and the fact that he's not as much not that good of an athlete like doesn't hurt him as much on slow play. Um, and he can use the serve in the forehand. Evans. I don't know why, but Evans has decent results on slow play. He made the semifinals actually here last year. Mm-hmm. Um, Evans has been absolutely awful this year. I think he's like three and he's nine. Really bad. Yeah. His confidence just looks absolutely terrible. <laughs> um, but he is five and seven in set one. Um, he does look like he, he looks like absolute, like he looks really terrified to close out a match. Okay. Uh, but my bet here is I've gotten behind Evans on the plus 140 in set one money line. Interesting. I don't think like, I think this is pretty 50 50 on just like the pure. And I think Evans, I think this should be a good matchup for Evans against Nakashima. Like, I don't think Nakashima is going to like, like, like the ball being kind of massaged around the court. I don't think that's good for him. I have I've no staring, interest in Evans I've been trying staring to close at this out a line match. for like half an hour today. And I was just like, well, what do I play here? Uh, yeah, I, I have no Evan, interest in Evans trying to close out a match. I think he can be an absolute wreck mentally. Yeah. Um, and I don't even like I, the under here either, right? Usually in these, these clay court matches, like I, I, I like the under, but like not even in this match because as you said, you know, Evans can win the first set and it just like be terrified to close it out, right? Yeah. So... Okay. I, I hear your logic. So Evans has won five of the last seven first sets. But no, last- no, he's five and seven this year in first sets versus three and nine overall. Oh. But the point is he's been okay in the first set. He's been passable. Like, and he's, <laughs> and he's played several, you know, he's played some decent opponents. Like, it's not like he's playing, like, challenge level guys. Yeah. Nakashima's also coming from Houston, which is a pretty different surface. Now, I'm sure he got here in plenty of time, but he hasn't had a match yet, like a true match on... Like on, like, on, clay, a true, yeah. on a true European clay. It's mostly that I, I want to get behind Evans here, but I really want to shorten the finish line. And so I think, uh, yeah, that's why I've gotten on the plus 140. I'm going to tail you. It's not GBM worthy, but um, I'll tail you on it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. One unit play. Nice. Nice. You convinced me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next match, Diaz Acosta and Daniel Rincon. Uh, Acosta is a four-game favorite. Minus 310 on the money line. Rincon is plus 250, over under 21 and a half. Like, I, I think this is a classic under spot. 
Uh, it's going to be my under parlay, but I got nothing else on it. Uh, see, I really want this under to be 22 instead of 21 and a half. Like if it was 22, I'd be all, I guess. What is 22 minus 120 under 22? Minus 130. Yeah, no. Like it's just off of me playing as an under. I probably should be on it as under, but I'm just off. Like basically that for like that four game spread is basically a uh, a 21 and a half under. It's basically the same thing. And I mm -hmm. think that spread is pretty right. Like yeah. Rincon, I mean, like, so Rincon, like the only thing Rincon really has going through one is that he's at home. Like he's 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 just not that good of a player. Right. Um even the challenge level he hasn't done that well. Like he's like one of Spain's theoretically better prospects, but the the pipeline for Spain, I mean, look, Spain has some great ATP players right now, you know, namely Alcaraz, but the pipeline's a little dry. Um mm -hmm. but um And Diaz Acosta has had a good year, you know, and he has that that lefty game. But outside of Buenos Aires, what has he really done? Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So but I don't really it's a similar then, court. Like, it's a similar court, court to Buenos Aires, though. Like in terms of, but it's in Europe. Well. And instead of having the home crowd, now Rincon's going to have the home crowd. Okay. I think this but, is about right. It, it's hard for me to get behind. Like I generally don't like big spreads. You know that, and so yeah. um, yeah, I think this is is pretty close. Okay. Like. Rincon's not in my circle of trust where I really want to back him as like a four and a half or five, you know, where I think he's four and a half to five games better than guys. Okay. All right. Next match, Arnaldi and Cazo. So Cazo is coming. You know, back if you wanted to get behind it, what's the under nine and a half games in the first set? In this match or the other one? No, in the other match. In the other match. Minus 115. I could be okay. There should be breaks. Yeah. And given the trend that we talked about, you know? Mm hmm Yeah. No, nah, I'm just gonna play the under 21 and a half. And I can actually, you know, me and the under I, I think the under 21 and a half is actually maybe not a bad play. Cause I get and then the other thing I'm thinking about is like, I don't know, there might be some chance that Rincon wins that 2-0. I doubt it, but there might be some chance that like a cost. There is there is a, there is a chance. But I think Yeah, I mean the the match is also at eleven a.m., so there's not going to be too much crowd there. True. You know, like True. I'm more going on based on the narrative that that uh, Diaz Acosta is just better. You know. Yeah, there might be value on Acosta there. There might be so there might be a hint a hint of value. I'm I'm tempted to get with it. There might be a, a hint. It's of in my value. under parlay, but it's not. I hear you. I'm not going to do this. I hear you. So, all right, next match, Arnaldi against Cazzo. So, Cazzo is coming back from injury. Um, I think he withdrew from uh, the tournament, like, in Monte Carlo, right? He was going to be in qualifying. Yeah. Then he he withdrew. Yeah. Yeah, against team. So, um, like, these are two, like, really talented guys that I like rooting for. And, like, I'm curious to see who's going to have a better career between these two guys. Um, I wish, like, Hazo was fully, you know, healthy so we kind of knew where he stood right now because, like, I, I think this could be a great match to watch. Um, I have really nothing on it besides the under 22 in a parlay, but, like, I don't really have a clear read on it just because of the Kazo question marks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I want to get behind Kazo here, but there's too many question marks around him. This for me is probably a dead stay away. It's if there's anything, it's probably the Kazo plus 200, just, just because, like, I don't think Arnaldi's that good on clay. Like, I think he's too erratic. I, I can't get there. I think he's a little bit better of a player than Kazo regardless. And then 
if you know if Kazo's injured, you know uh, if Kazo's not fully back yet or not fully match fit, like yeah, I, I can't get I can't get there. This, okay. but I get it. Like from a t- pure tennis perspective, I agree. I'm just I'm just not gonna play this because of the concerns about the injuries. Like I wish it was in the second round where we 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 had something yeah. to base off Kazo, right? Like yeah, yeah. All right, next match, uh, Roman Safulin against uh, Roberto Bautista Agut. Agut is a minus 170 favorite, <clears throat> uh, minus two and a half game favorite. Uh, Safulin is plus 140, over under 22 and a half. Um, I actually like RBA in some capacity here. I, I really don't think Safulin is good on slow clay. Um, but I think the under is my favorite play, though, um, just because... Like, if Sapulin is missing and he's just, like, all over the place, then RBA can win this, like, two and three. But then if Sapulin is just, like, you know, firing on all cylinders, like he was against Munar in um, in Monte Carlo, right, then he could win this two and three. So I see – I don't see much in between here, to be honest. But that, that's my take. And the fact that it's also 22 and a half, like this is probably going to be an under 22 and a half single bet as well for me. Okay. I can see that. I can see the first one. Uh-huh. Um, so if Yulin did make the third round of Rome last year, he qualified and then he beat Yaron in Corda. Um, and Yaron was okay on play last year. Like, Well, well that's why I prefer the unders than the uh than the than the money line because like if Safulin is firing in all cylinders he could he could beat anyone yeah I mean you could also have him fire away for a set and then not fire away for a set like he's not I like mean, that though like if he's firing I mean they played like... five at Wimbledon these two yeah, guys but also he he had to go up two sets and in this case he would have won the match yeah, but yeah, I, he did it against I, Paul yeah, I, too, right? Like what? against Paul at the U.S. Open as well. He was up two sets. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think I think you could see Roman. Uh... Well, you're playing the Roman plus one forty. I think so. There's not much value on it at this point. It's not a multi-unit play. Like it was one fifty earlier, and I'm pissy I didn't hit it at one fifty. I think like one forty. Is significantly worse, but that that's where I'm at on it. Okay. I don't think Roman's that bad on slow clay. Like, okay, he got trounced by Djokovic. Like, why are we saying he's so bad on, on slow clay? It it to me, it's more not about the slow clay. It's more about like if he's feeling it or not on that given day. Because he can he can just fire away and beat anyone, but then he can also just like dump like 50 balls in the net and just be absolutely atrocious and that's why i love unders with him how often does he go three sets i'm just kind of going more like from the eye test yeah i mean so i'm looking at it right like last year and granted this includes i guess i can throw out madrid so if you're just looking at at the other tournaments not madrid he went over the 22 and a half games in two out of eight matches since the beginning of 2023, which supports your argument. But two of those included tie breaks. Obviously, if those tie breaks went the other way, then they those would have gone way over. So I don't know. It's not a huge sample. Um, recently he's going been going more under yeah in terms of yeah if you include uh yeah if you include the past six seven eight nine man yeah ten matches but then yeah i don't know i'm not rba has also been better recently what rba has also been better in the last couple of weeks, he has been. That's why I'm a little concerned. I hear you. I hear you. Um, 
I hear you. I've I've gone Rome on money line here, but I, I hear you. It's it's okay. I hear the twenty two point five. It's either is probably a decent bet. Okay. I'm just a little worried about three sets. Okay. I also wanted to see what is the Roman two one. The Roman two one is plus four forty. Yeah, I don't I mean, I don't know. Like, if you want to get behind, like, if you want to get behind some kind of like old man can't go three sets with RVA. If fitness is not really an issue, it's not like Vavrinka, where he can't play three sets. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at it like. I'm looking since the beginning of 23. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you might be right. I don't know. It, it could go either way. Like, He's had some ugly three, ugly third sets and some better third sets. <laughs> it's it's. Uh, I'll probably just stick with the Roman money line. Okay. All right, we got Duje and Trungaletti. Honestly, I don't know too much about these guys. I don't know. Do you have a read on this? Not really watching Trungaletti plays. He's he's Trungaletti's got like a nice. He's got a decent game, um, but he's very like. He's probably on like the good side of decent. I think I've seen Duje play once. Um, under I, really do, I think I might I might have gone under nine and a half in the first set here. Plus one hundred five. No, I didn't. I did not go under nine and a half. No. This is this is this is just a stay away from me. I I think that I was yeah. looking at like Trinjali beat the crap out of Zapata Morales in crowd qualifying, which is even though Zapata Morales hasn't been good, that still is a good win. Yeah, everyone's um, been the crap out of Zapata Morales. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I think this is like it just at first glance. I think this line is, is decent enough. I'll probably just stay away. I don't know that much about these guys either. And I, I, it feels pick and ish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Harold Mayo against Pedro Cachin. I'm all over Mayo here at minus 140. I'm all over the under nine and a half in the first set at plus 105. That's probably. And I think the under 22 and a half games could be a good look as well here for the match. That's in my parlay as well. I just feel like, uh, man, I feel like catching has got to be really in the dumps where if he, if he loses the first set, yeah, that could be a huge, uh, bleh for him. Um, has he won he a match, won a match this year? year, right? Has Kachin won a match this year? No, I'm pretty sure he's not. Wow. Now he's gotten closer in, in recent weeks on the clay. Yeah, but but you'd seven. rather have Kachin at altitude. Yeah. <laughs> Kachin against Bavrinka. He, he but he won the first at seven six, and then Bavrinka beat him one and two in this in the second and third. Like that just shows you where Kachin is. Yeah. Yeah, he's not in a great spot. No, he's not. I mean, he hasn't won a match. But Mayo's before, also so I don't not know how you can back him to win a match what? here. How can you back him to win here when Mayo has qualified and just won two matches, right? But Mayo's just not that good. Still, when when you haven't won a match all year, like the, the confidence is just so low. Like you don't believe that you can win. Like that's why I prefer unders here. I mean, I, I like think the there's gonna too. be breaks. Either what? Either way you want to look at it. I, I like the under too. Yeah, like because I feel like if Kachin wins a set. Like, if he wins the first set, maybe he does believe, you know? And, like, I think he's I think he's a better player than Mayo, just as a, as a player. If his confidence was in decent form, I just don't think, I don't think very highly of Mayo at all. I think he's like a, I don't know, I think he's a, he's like a pure challenger guy. Like, he should be on the challenger tour. <laughs> Most of the time he is, but like I, that's yeah. just what I think of him. Like, Okay. I'm going with the Mayo money line. So you're going with the under there? Yeah, and my favorite play there is the under first set, under the nine and a half at plus money. 
All right, Hart and Len Deluce. Uh, don't know too much about these guys either. We want we. I think you and I both watched. I mean, we didn't watch it live. We, I think we saw Nick Hart. No, we definitely watched him play one time. You and I played watched him together play in like qualifying for some slam or something. Oh. Yeah. Did you see any of the Len Deluce Shelton match in Miami? Did you go to that? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. No, we were there together. Remember. By the time we walked yeah, in, it was like basically I wasn't over. sure if we like parted ways for a little bit. No, we by the time we walked in, it was basically over. We got there too late. Okay. We literally walked in there as they were interviewing Shelton. Ah, that's right. That's right. Um, but um, Lando Luce, he's young. Lando Luce's only 18. He's um he's got some skills, but I think he's I think he's at this point basically a, a forehand and an okay serve. Um Hart is like a very just blase challenger level player. Doesn't really do anything special. Um we need the under here too. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's like okay, except here I went with the, only the first set under, the first set under nine and a half. Like Lana Luce's got a lot of talent. Hart um doesn't really do anything special. Like if Lana Luce's playing well, he could run away with it. If not, it might yeah. go the other way. Like so All I right, don't think it's a half in the first set, but I get it. Next match, uh, Moeller against uh, ARV. Uh, Moeller is a slight favorite, but basically pick them at minus 120. Uh, ARV's even money over under 22 and a half. Um, honestly, it's another one where I just I just lean the under. Like, I think all of these are, are one or one and a half game too high. Like... I'm surprised the book hasn't adjusted really, and they're still putting these at the the twenty two and a halfs. Well, it's not so much book right against the markets betters. Yeah, I just think it's not. You know, it's it's if you look at those stats from the last two years, it's staggering, right? So I went, I went under nine and a half in the first set, but I think you could go either way. I think either under for the, the nine and a half in the first set where the match is fine. Mm -hmm. They're both the same idea. Yeah. I mean, from a tennis perspective, who I I don't really have a feel as who's going to win. I probably lean Mueller, but Mueller hasn't been good recently. I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you 100%. Like, yeah, that's why I've gone with the unders. I mean, I think if you think about going over, then just bet the three set line. Oh, 100%. 100%. Right? And it's plus 130, which is okay, but, like, I still prefer the under. Yeah. Next I think if you want to do a parlay, you could do a parlay of under 10 and a half in the first set. If that makes you feel safer. Ooh, I like that idea. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's a, that's a really good idea. But that's kind of like the no tie break. It's basically right. the same thing. Yeah. It's basically similar. Same yeah. Same idea. <laughs> All right. Kotov, Offner. Uh, Kotov is minus 120. Offner is even money over under 22 and a half. Oh. <sighs> I mean, do you have a play here? No. No, I think this is, I mean, I'm leaning Kotov. I might end up playing Kotov. It's close for me. I kind of want to play Kotov. Yeah, didn't Offner have a decent win last week? Yeah, oh, he beat Evans, but everyone beats Evans right now. <laughs> yeah, then lost three and four to, to Zverev. Kotov, uh, he played in Marrakech, right? And he lost, uh, he won two matches. He beat Kaboli and Fonini. And then he, oh, and Benchikrit. And then he lost to Carbide, yeah. you know. Like, I think both these guys are honestly playing like, I don't know, between like 50 and 100 ATP level tennis right now. Yeah, they're pretty e they're pretty even. But like yeah. the book has it right. That the price it's it's priced correctly. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm off that. I'm a little scared to play an under first set there. I think that the, those actually two guys could go over could end up playing three sets. Uh Altmeyer and Poppy. Um I like Poppy minus the two and a half games here. 
Altmaier really hasn't been good. No, but that was all on hard course. I feel like he's a better. He's better on clay. Um, I mean, he I lost to Mute it. two and four, and then got into the Monte Carlo a draw as a lucky loser, and then lost to Sorindolo. In Estoril, he lost four and two to Martinez. And then Poppy, I think these are good conditions for him. I might have to ride Poppy again. I hadn't thought about this that much. I'll probably ride Poppy here, but it's close. It's either Poppy or stay away. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be like three and a half. Like, I think it's it's a little off. So, uh, Diego Schwartzman against Dusan Lajevic. Uh On paper, this should be a good matchup for, for Lajevic. But Schwartzman has been a little better, and he qualified easily here. So I'm probably just... I don't know. I think... I'm looking at something real quick. It's probably a decent underspot, honestly. Oh, I don't know about that. Schwartzman, like, Schwartzman competes pretty well. Um... I mean, my my first glance was you got to play Lajevich, but mm -hmm. I'm looking at something quick. <sighs> Schwartzman this year versus guys ranked 50 to 100 in the world, 1-4. Losses okay. to Mickelson, Galan, Kachmatovic, and Acosta. Okay. His one win was beating Rindernack 7-6 in the third. I don't know. I feel like like Schwartzman, I feel like he's established himself pretty well now. He's he's, he's established like his new level. And his new level is like good challenger player. Like slightly outside the ATP level tour, like good challenger player. Like something between like 100 and 120 in the world. Okay. Which if Live which is anything near his normal self, he's not still... concerned the fact that he lost his last match he played, he lost first round of qualities to Muller two and three. I guess you could argue it was surface transition. But that's like a place he's done really well. He made a final there in the past. Yeah, fair. I'm a little bit concerned. I'm not. I don't know. I'd be more concerned if he had like a, a, like a bad run-up besides that. Like, And the Lyovic compete level is not as high as Schwartzman. No, but no, but I, don't well, I would prefer if, if you got under 22 and a half, that's where I'm going. You'll get that. I I would play live and share the money, live account the money line. I think he's just a better, he's just at this point, he's just better than Schwartzman. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think his compete level. Like, I don't think live compete level is going to be a problem against Schwartzman, who he's like, Especially on clay, who he's like equal to or better. From what I remember from Lyovic, like when the compete level tends to get low, is when he's playing against guys who are better than him and he just doesn't believe. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I can't. Like even Tiafo, he kind of he got he got kind of down. But I think it's more that he like bought into the Tiafo hype. It was a night match, crowd was going getting excited when Tiafo was doing stuff like. I'm more concerned about that loss that he had in qualifying to Muller two and three in condition. Yeah, it's a, it's a concerning loss. I, I don't disagree. It's yeah. a concerning loss. No. I just think that, like, the market, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is a, I mean, the market's got to be weighing that in really heavily to get all the way to minus 125 here. Because you take that loss out, and this is probably like Fair point. minus. Probably minus 165, minus 170. Oh, probably, yeah, maybe, maybe even higher. It's probably like minus 180 to minus 200 with Schwartzman being like minus, like plus 150 to plus 170, something like that. So like, it's a big move for one loss, especially with the a service transition in play. I'll, I'm, I think I'm going to buy into live here at a minus 125. Okay. Okay. All right. Kaboli and Nadal. Um, uh... This is interesting. Kaboli's four and a half game uh, underdog. 
plus 325 on the money line. Nadal minus 425 over under. The difference, the under, you never see over under of 20 and a half of the four and a half game spread, or you very rarely do. Yeah. Usually you would see this at 21. I think there's a, but I don't necessarily disagree with it. Like. No, me neither. But I, I'm going to play the Kaboli money line plus 325. Like, I'm just not buying this Nadal health. Um, I don't know. I I got to see it to believe it. And, like, that's a good good enough price for against a respectable opponent. Like, Kaboli's not a scrub, you know? No, he's not. He's not. <laughs> um, I mean... I think that's the only way you can play this match is Kabuli plus 325 money line. I guess that's the only logical play I see here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess if you want to back Rafa, you could back him, but I, I wouldn't want to. No, but... Um, I'll probably stay away, but I, I, I don't know. I, I get it. Like, I think it makes, it all depends on how much you believe. Like the problem is like peak Rafa, this line is nowhere near far enough. But it's all over 12 and a half is actually interesting at minus 105. Oh, I don't like that at all. No, no, because he can't. I mean, you just said he could get beat here. Yeah, he could, but uh, if he gets beat, I mean, he's gonna dig in, right? And I like, I, oh, I, I mean, he's, he's always dug in his whole career, but like, I don't know, man, if he's if he's physically. Like I think actually if you back Kaboli, I think the Kaboli 2 1 at plus 750 is the way to go. Because like to me, it's hard to believe that Nadal is just gonna give in and like he's gonna give 120% on every point. <clears throat> how he ha has always done, right? But he, he might just run out of gas. So that's probably what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit the Kaboli 2 1 at plus 750. I get it. I get it. I, I I'm just staying away here. I don't I don't know enough about Nadal's health. Okay. Yeah, no one does. No one does, but... Even Rafa probably doesn't. That's <laughs> probably true. Uh, Hugo Grenier against uh, RCB. Uh, Grenier is just a bad clay court player. <laughs> he just... Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? that, that's like, well said. That's what it is. Like, like we're not, we're not going crazy with the Hugo G nickname anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean... The problem is, this is a big line on Baena. Like, I um, I like the RC. I think like is better at altitude clay. Like the two events he's won in his career are Marrakech and Quito. True. Okay. I feel like he needs, but this also should be a good match for me. It's Higo G because I feel like if there's something RCB does well, it's get balls back in the court. Yeah, the RCB two zero at minus one thirty five is actually not terrible. Yeah, I mean, I got to think about this one. I'm hoping. This one's not until... So I have some time. This one's not until Tuesday morning. Yeah. Um, a couple more matches. Wame Munar against uh, Yoshi Nishioka. When's the last time Yoshi played? Good question. He's been really bad this year. He played in Miami. Okay. Lucky loser. Lost to Kaboli. Then he played Indian Wells. Oh, has Yoshi really been that bad this year? He's been okay. If you look at his results, they're fine. I think he is. I think we got carried away with Yoshi when he cracked the top 30 or the top 50, like, for a while. Yeah. And he settled back to what he is, which is, like... He's, he's been a lucky really loser long. quite often. What? He's been a lucky loser quite often. He was a lucky loser in Acapulco. He was a lucky loser in Miami. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you're like, <clears throat> which I don't really understand why he's lucky loser in Miami. I don't really understand why his ranking's high enough. I don't know if he forgot to sign up or what. His ranking should be high enough to get into a 96 person draw. Yeah. I'm like, I guess maybe not. He was the number two seed in qualities. I guess maybe not. Like, maybe everybody signed up. I can't remember. I'm off this match though. I have no read on it. Like I, I, I would, I would never back Munar as a four and a half game favorite against anyone. Honestly, uh, I wish the over under was twenty two and a half here, then I'd probably be on the under. Um, I think the Munar money line is a decent parlay piece, but like that's it. 
<sighs> yeah, it's hard to say, man. Like, I don't, I don't really know that I buy into to clo- I mean, <sighs> I'm tempted to back like Yoshi to win a set or something, like. I don't I don't know that he's been that bad this year. Like I think he's been like just standard like mediocre Yoshi. I don't know that he's like like is Munar that much better, I guess. On clay, I think he is. It's at home. Like these conditions are good for Munar. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you know what? Also, Yoshi I think is... to stay away. What is the? Can you go back up to the spread again? The money line, the spread. Four and a half, I think. Yeah, it's 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 a stay away from me. Also, the thing is, Yoshi, like he gets whiny. So if Munar is just well, getting... that's what I was gonna say. So four and a half looks like a lot, but with Yoshi, I almost always like if he's Yoshi's a big dog. I almost always add like a half game at least, if not a full game, into my handicap. Yeah. To account for like. Like Yoshi is playing a lot of under sets. What is the under nine and a half in set one of the Yoshi match? That's or what is the actually, you know, honestly, the under 21 and a half is probably a good look too. Probably. Like these guys are not playing sets over 12 and a half games. Or actually, another way to look at it is like, what are the player totals? What are the under 12 and a half rate for the player totals? Minus 120 and for Munar. What about Munar? I mean, that, that looks okay to me. Like. Yoshi under nine is even money. Yeah, I like that. Yoshi, I mean, I don't know. I, I I'm probably just gonna stay. I mean, what is the under nine and a half games in set one? Minus 145. No. I think the under 21 and a half, if you want to play that match, that's the only logical look. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the whininess, it, it, it could be. And this is a mad, this this seems like a whiny spot because if Munar is just grinding away, getting a ton of balls back, it's going to be frustrating for Yoshi, you know? Because like finding holes in the court is going to be tough. Slow conditions. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, like. And then these yeah. guys are also like, you know, like Munar is kind of childish too. It's, it's just four like, and a half is a lot of games. Remember, like Yoshi, you know. Like four and a half is a lot of games. Yeah. But also, Munar is, like, childish, right? So, like, sometimes he goes crazy over a bad call, and then, like, Yoshi might get involved, and, like, as soon as there's some kind of drama, it, it's going to go downhill for one of these guys, I feel. Right? They're both... I feel like Yoshi's childish. a lot more like that with Munar. I know this is the one time when he did, like, the whole picture thing, but I can't remember too many other times Munar's, like, <laughs> gone wild and gone, like, you know, and just getting, like... And honestly, that was like right at the end of the match. Like it wasn't like true. It's true. like I think Munar's a lot less like a go downhill. <laughs> All right, Van Ash and Zhen Zhang. Uh, this is one of my favorite plays. Actually, I, I'm going to tail the Bet Rivers guys and go Zhang money line at even money, especially in these slow conditions. Like I don't know. I I think Zhang should be should be a favorite. I think he should be a significant favorite here. I mean, I, I think this is. Is it GBM? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, I like this pick a lot. I mean, and I like what the GBM, GBM guy said. I just don't see why Van Ash would be good on slow play. Like, again, it's kind of the opposite of what we say, right? Like, or not the, it's like, like there's a theory out there that like making a lot of balls is good on clay. And it's true, but like, like, mm-hmm. what is Van Ash going to do? Like, I feel like the quicker courts are actually better for Van Ash because you can kind of like redirect the ball around and use that to actually at least create some sort of offense. Whereas like on slow play, he can't create anything. Yeah, exactly. Zhang is going to be the one bullying him around. And like the only way Zhang loses his matchup is that if he hits like 80 unforced errors. Which he could. Like he could. it's not like, he could. like I, I like, I think he loses this at least 40% of the time, Zhang. Yeah, but Van Ash also hasn't been that good. Like he um he lost last week to I don't know why I backed him. I think he lost to Munar in Marrakech. Then last week he lost in the Quali's first round to Altmaier. Yeah. 
And like we were, I remember Zhang last year, like he was pretty good on clay. He has some a little extra time on the ball, right? And he he can he has so much more ability to hit through the court. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I love Zhang. You know, don't get me wrong. I think I'm just saying I think I think Van Ash is live, but at minus 120, I, I want somebody to be more than live. Like, so yeah, I'm, I'm all yeah. over Zhang here, but even money. I really don't understand what the market's seeing, to be honest. Besides like the fact that like Zhang plays some like the occasional just terrible match, like I think Zhang had that terrible, didn't he have a terrible loss on Clay? No, it wasn't Clay. That was, that was hardcore. He lost to Domingo. But like, I mean, Zhang could come out and just completely lay, lay an egg. Oh, maybe, maybe it's because he lost to Martin Dom in Miami. Like, but again, like Zhang could, like, that's the thing, right? Like, Zhang could come out and just lay a complete egg and lose this. But I'll take him at even money. I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right. So that'll be a GBM play tomorrow. Yep. Right? Uh, and then the last match is uh, Tomas Machak against Shen Shen Shang. Um, on first glance, I'm inclined to bet the Shang plus 175. Um, I'm high on Machak. I, I don't think Clay is quite as good for him. This is also a surface transition for him. I'm curious to see Machak's stats on clay last year, because I know like he's really started this good run of form in the fall of last year. Yeah. Shank played the Madrid challenger and he beat Moro Kanyas five and two, and then he lost in three to Huesler. Um, a chalk. I like Shang here. You like Shang here? Yeah, I mean, I man, maybe not. It might be a stay away. It's close. I'll probably stay away. The more I look at it, like, I, mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm torn. Maybe not. I don't know. I gotta think about this a lot more. It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm never on my couch here. The question is, is it a stay away or is it Shang money line? Well, uh, Machak is eight and nine in the last fifty-two weeks on clay. In his career, he's sixty-one and thirty-seven, but that also includes a ton of challengers and futures. Yeah. Um, but just last year, he lost to Gerard Campana Lee in the Liberec Challenger. That was his last match on clay. I mean, he did retire from that match, so maybe there was something going on. Um. But I don't see like any good wins on clay ever in his career. I see Jerome. Um, but like no top 50 wins. He did beat uh VDZ once upon a time in 21 on clay. But nothing close to a top 50 win. The problem is, like, that's a different Makach, right? Like, he's a lot better player. Yeah, but we haven't seen then. this version of Machak on a clay, on a clay court. And I don't, like, think his game really translates. I don't... Like, he, he kind of... He doesn't really hit, like, spin, big spin, right? He just kind of maneuvers the ball around the court and uses his movement. He's big. I mean, he's aggressive, though. He's an aggressive enough player. It's not like he's, like, a passive player. Yeah, he's decent in that. Too. Yeah. Before I back him, I would want to see it, but plus 175 is a decent price, Shang. It is. It is. And he qualified. You know what? I want Shang. I'll take Shang. He qualified and there's a certain okay. transition from Makachi. I'll, I'll, I'll take Shang. It can't be GBN just because we haven't seen Machak on play court. Yeah, but I'll take Shang. Oh, I'm money line Shang. That's fine. All right. I'll take that too. All right. I think that's it for this tournament. I, right. I need a quick five minute break. Quick break. Yep. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, welcome back to the show, everyone. So um, one tournament down, two to go. Uh, yeah. Let's transition to uh, Munich. ETP Munich. So uh, Munich, I heard it's going to be pretty cool conditions. Uh, oh, I mean, we this, so this this is there, there is out to this tournament. That's the first thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, it is. Um, I think it's about, I think it's got about five maybe fifteen hundred feet of altitude, a little under five hundred meters. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So he usually plays a little bit quicker, but I don't know about this year. I don't know if you've seen the weather, Manny. Yeah. There is snow in the forecast. (laughs) We could have an (laughs) ATV event in snow. Do you, I don't know if you remember this or not, but here's a little trivia question for you. Who, which, which, uh, which professional tennis player, uh, had the quote, you're making us sit here like ducks during the, when they played the French open in October. There was like a, a brief shower rain delay and they, they made the players still on the court. And it was like under 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It was like eight degrees Celsius. And one of the, uh, there was a player, I remember who it is. It's a trivia question for you. One of the players said, you're making us sit here like ducks. I mean, that's something Medvedev would say. It was Azarenka. It's Azarenka. Okay. Yeah. I don't follow the women's tour, so. I mean, I don't regularly either, but I do remember that line. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a good line. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really one where we are sitting here like ducks, like, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. <laughs> I don't oh, know where man. ducks came from, but it was fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, the, the weather is an absolute disaster. It's, it's expected, I think, chance of precipitation is higher than 50, 50% or higher. Yeah. Every day of the week. Wow. Um, it was it, really it, cold and rainy here last year, too. I just feel like this is like just a weird, just a rainy, rainy tournament. Um, and they're they're making this a 500 next year, which just like it, it's it doesn't make any sense. And like, I remember watching this tournament. It's like right near like a residential area. They're like apartment buildings in the background. It, it doesn't it, it seems like a 250. Yeah. You know? Like, I don't know why this is becoming a, a 500 along with Dallas. Like that, that made no sense to me too, but that, that's well, Dallas. They're going to do it in Jerry world. That's why. What? Dallas. They're going to do it in Jerry world. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whereas right now this played at the, on the SMU campus. So like right now it looks really lame as a 250, but next year it's going to be in Jerry world. So it's okay. it theoretically. It's gonna okay. Be cool. All right. All right. So let's go over the draws. Oh, oh, more on the conditions, I guess. Right. So altitude. Uh, how does the court play though? Like pretty. S- so usually a little quicker. Like usually, I wouldn't say like maybe not quite as fast as Madrid, but usually quicker than um than these than the other than the the sea you know than the non altitude or whatever sea level courts, right? Definitely mm-hmm. quicker than Monte Carlo. Definitely quicker than Barcelona. Um, so usually this usually the serve plays up, but this week with the cool court being you know with it being under fifty degrees and, and if it rains, the court's gonna be super damp um yeah i don't i i i I actually think unders could be a play here this week because Mm -hmm. like usually it plays a little bit usually it plays like medium clay to maybe a little bit faster like a little bit quicker than 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 standard clay yeah but with it being this cold and damp like it's going to be a problem in general though i'm really i mean we'll talk about it more but i'm really scared to play anybody in this tournament man it just seems like a disaster waiting to happen well i'm i'm willing to play german guys because they're going to be i'm with the exception of zverev yeah i think those guys are going to be motivated right like okay in their home crowd and stuff so uh we'll go over it i i have one or two plays uh so zverev in the first quarter we got zverev um the number one seed, he'll play the winner of Rodionov and Vukic. Um, Redberg and Michelson, uh, the winner of that match, will play Garin and Kupfer. Um, I don't think we had their quarter prices up on this, right? They do. They do? Okay. They just went up, yep. Wow. That's Bucharest. Okay, so we got Zverev at minus 165. Garin at plus 550, Michelson at plus 650, Kopfer at plus 750, Vukic at 10 to 1, Rodionov at 16 to 1, and Breberg at um 33 to 1. So um I don't have a play here. If if I was gonna play anything, it would probably be Kopfer. But Kopfer is not really good on play. I don't think he's very good at moving on it. But that would be kind of my lean there, just based on price. But honestly, Zverev should win the quarter. It's just minus 165 doesn't excite me. And, like, I don't know how motivated he's going to be. Granted, there's Madrid next week, you know. How well does Zverev play in snow? (laughs) I mean, really, right? Like, no, but but from a tennis perspective, I agree. Minus 165 is actually a decent price on Zverev, given, like, what you're asking. Yeah. He was winning two matches against this field. But, I mean, he, like, 
I mean, given the Madrid, to your point, Madrid's next week. Like, if this tournament's too much of a disaster, I could see, I could see Wisvera withdrawing. Yeah, but the I mean, problem it's is like for the for for you know his home country and his fans, but like he doesn't give a crap. But it's understandable, right? Like, I, it'd be it'd be disappointing, but I don't think it'd be like embarrassing. Like, the weather would be the embarrassing part. Like the scheduling, yeah. you know, Like, you know, look if if it's under. 10 degrees Celsius. Don't, I don't, I don't know. I can't blame any player for not wanting to play in those conditions. I mean, like, like for a guy like Vera, that's dangerous. Like it's an increased risk of injury. Like why bother for a tournament that there's no reason for him to play? Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, it is his whole country and like, I, I don't know. It's, I but I, 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 yeah, I, I'm not backing him at that price. There's no way. There's no way. I mean, I, I think it's a decent price from a tennis perspective. But again, like I just I question the motivation there. Um, and I think this is like one of those we've really I think we've done a good job of stopping with having the motivation line for every tournament. But I do think this is a tournament where you have to take that into play. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Because like this could I mean like but on the other but the problem with it is on the flip side it could not end up being a disaster. Like the weather could end up being okay and like. If it somehow sits at like in the fifties Fahrenheit, ten like ten ish Celsius, ten to fifteen Celsius, and it somehow stays dry half the days, like it could be okay. You know what I mean? Then maybe the top guys do stick around. I mean, it was really cold. it was really cold and damp here last year, and uh, Zverev lost to. But how cold was cold? It was pretty cold. I remember people were like bundled up in like down jackets and stuff. Is there a temperature for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he lost to O'Connell. Okay. If I remember correctly in the first round. So, but he's won this event twice. It's not like people say that he doesn't play well here. I don't think it's an event problem. For, and he's won Hamburg. Like, I don't think this is an event problem or a pressure problem. Yeah, my only concern here is just the weather. Okay. Okay. Um, second quarter, we got Taylor Fritz. Um, he will play, I think this is a surface transition, right? He didn't play Houston. No. Right? So, yeah, first match on play for him. Oh, he played um, Monte Carlo, lost to Mazzetti. That's right. That's right. So, um, Moro Cañas and Dominic Team. Then we got Hasaro. He'll play the wild card Moloker. And then uh, Vit Popriva will play the winner. Uh, will play uh, Jack Draper. So, as far as quarter prices go, here Fritz is plus one thirty. That's uh, that's a terrible price. Draper plus one forty, terrible price. Team plus six fifty, terrible price. Pissarro, Moloker, Moral Con. I, I got nothing here. This is this is a disaster of a quarter. Fritz. I can't trust him on clay with the service transition really slow. Like I, I'm not backing him here. Drake oh, I mean, I, so actually like if, if the weather was decent, I would back Fritz here. Like he's just like, he's so much better than everybody else here, but Draper and like Fritz isn't, I think the Fritz being bad on clay is a little overstated. Is it his best surface? No. Is he significantly worse outside of America? Yes. Uh, that Monte Carlo, um, Run, I think, was an outlier. I'm gonna pull up some of his clay, his clay stats in his career. It's not, I don't think it's as bad. So, like last year, he made third round of Roland Garros, semis of Geneva, uh, round of 16 in Madrid, and he choked that match versus Zhang. He easily could have made quarters, semis here in Munich, and semis in Monte Carlo. That's not bad. It's not good by Fritz's standards, but like... Yeah, but I also think he's in worse form this year than he was last year leading into the clay court season. So you have to put that into account, too. I don't know about that. Like, No, I'm, I'm not backing Fritz here. No way. I would. I would. I mean, like, who beats him? Like, you think Dami team's going to beat him? The rest of these guys aren't even ATP-level players. Yeah, that, that's that's a decent point. I guess it's just Draper. But then Draper, you can't trust him to, you know, especially if there's rain delay. Like, right, can you imagine if he has to play two matches? In oh, a Draper is a disaster. disaster. Like, 
And, and you can't play Fritz because if it's snowing, like Fritz is not going to come out in the snow. Like Fritz will go home. Like he's a California kid. He has no interest in playing. You know what I mean? Like it's. It, well, that's another point. Like he, he doesn't like cold weather. It's a no play for me, but it's a no play for my points. It's a no play for me because of the weather. It's not a no play for me because of the, um, okay. Of the, of the tennis. Like, I think, I, I guess I disagree with your saying it's a terrible, like plus 130 looks like a terrible price at first glance. But it's really not, given just how far above the rest of the field he is, except for, I guess, maybe Draper. Fair, fair. It's a terrible quarter. I mean, I'm tempted to play, like, Molliker or maybe Koprava here, just because of the pricing. And you just hope, like, I don't well, know. Well, I, think Draper, will one, I like... think Draper will win tomorrow against Co Copriva, right? Like, tomorrow the weather isn't terrible. Um, It's a 100% <laughs> chance of rain. Yeah, but it's the first match on, so like I'm not too concerned because like if the if it gets postponed or something, like he he'll get on right. So the physicality is not going to be a problem in the first match. So that's why I don't want to bet back for Priva here. But uh, he, I mean, but but it's thirty three to one, just by like whatever randomness variance. There's some kind of chance he beats Draper. If it's if he if he somehow beats Draper. And you get him into the, and then you and then the weather gets bad and Fritz pulls out. Like it's thirty three to one in an event that that they couldn't be. I don't think after. Fritz is going to pull out. Fritz is not like that. Oh, we. I mean, if it's snowing, if it's under, <laughs> it's, we don't we don't see we don't see ATP tournaments under fifty degrees. I mean, like I'm being a little exaggerated with the snowing, but if this gets really backed up and the weather's like under fifty degrees, I don't think. I'm not gonna say like, oh, this guy's not like that. It's not he's not he's not gonna pull out because he's not like that. Yeah, like, I, I don't think he's gonna withdraw. I wouldn't put it over fifty percent, but I think it's definitely in play. Like, what if this event ends up being like Houston last year, where they can only get they can't even get to the yeah, second round until like Saturday? Disaster. What? Yeah, that's a disaster. I mean, like, I, I mean, and it, it's it, it'd be a pure price play. It would have nothing to do with tennis. It'd be a pure price play. But I'm tempted just as a pure price, and you just hope that like. Nobody else wants to be there, and he he beats you know, mm -hmm. he wins a terrible quarter with terrible tennis. Like team is not interesting because like six fifty like. No, I'm I'm actually actually backing Moro Kanyas tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next quarter. Uh, Felix Ojeal Yassim against uh, Max Martyrer. Uh, the winner of that match will play Taro Daniel or Chris O'Connell. Ivan Gakov qualified. He'll play uh, Bodek, who choked last year against Holger Rune uh, in the final. And then Jan Leonard Stroop. This is a much stronger quarter, for sure. Um, as far as quarter prices go here, uh, we got VDZ at plus 350, O'Connell at 5-1, FA at plus 225, Gakov at 80-1, to one, Stroop at 2-1, to one, um, Martyr at 10-1, to one, Daniel at 11-1. Um, from a quarter perspective, I don't have any play here, but I'm backing Struve here, um, as an outright at 14 to one. Okay. That's my play. Um, uh, I, I'm tailing the, the Bet Rivers guys, but I think, you know, the altitude is going to help him, um, he needs points because like there's no guarantee he's gonna back up those uh those final points in in Madrid, you know. So yeah. Um, but I, I think like this is a good core for him. He's gonna be motivated, he's a German. Um so I I don't know. I can't get there. Uh it's it's because the problem is I can't get there on the tennis. There's too many, like, okay. on the tennis, there's too many guys in this event who are better than him. You've got Rune and Zverev in this event who at a minimum are much better than him. Much, much better than him. Mm -hmm. And I think Fritz, even Fritz on clay, I don't think Fritz is that bad on clay. I think he's better than Struve as well. Well, he wouldn't he, play him until the final. So if I ha if I have that going in, in the final, I think uh, that, that that's fine. You're not going to get a good hedge price. If it's Zverev, you're going to get, like, you're not going to get a good hedge price if it's Zverev. Or even Fritz. I mean, I would back Stroop over Fritz. I'm not at even at had minus one had pick. Um, 
At pick, I'd probably back Struff, honestly. I think that's a bit insane. I mean, so I'm not high on, on Fritz on clay. I, I I really don't like him on clay. Last year on clay, Fritz was 11 and 6, 8 and 5 outside of that Monte Carlo run. He's really not that bad. Like by his standards, he's bad, but he still is probably a top 30 player, even on clay. Like, mm. I mean, but then you could say Struff had that good run in, in, uh, in uh, Madrid, right? So that kind of, uh, like, I, personally, I think the Struff run in Madrid is an outlier. And I think the Fritz run in Monte Carlo was an outlier too. So like, I think but Fritz is a run. lot more backing up than just the Monte Carlo run. Like again, semis, semis in Munich, round of 16 Madrid, and he absolutely shook the match versus Zhang. Semis in Geneva. Like there's a few decent results there. Okay. Again, if you're if you're saying is he like top ten on clay? No, of course not. But like, is he top thirty? Probably. Is that better than Struff? I would say so. I actually don't think Struff is that bad on clay. Like I think clay. Well, but again, like let's define that bad. Surface. Probably, but is he top thirty on clay? I can't. I can't. I mean, I I wouldn't say so. But I get. I mean, I guess that depends. It depends on how you feel about like. But again, it's kind of all on the point. The problem is like. If he has to play, so so forget that. Like, is Rune is is Rune losing before the quarters, or before the semis? Uh, I guess we can go over that last quarter. So Rune will play the winner of Uga Carbelli and Galan. No, he's not losing that. And then Husler, Topo, Shevchenko, and Hoffman. Probably not. So then you need Struff to get through a Rune and, you know, Zverev or you know Zverev or if you're lucky Fritz. And that's assuming he wins. The, he wins a relatively tough. But Rune game. Rune plays kind of to the level of the opposition. So theoret, I mean, he could lose to Hoffman. Hoffman likes these conditions. He likes cold. Yeah, he said he liked it. <laughs> well, he likes the event. I don't know if he likes cold. I mean, he likes the event. Okay. I'm definitely backing him against Shevchenko. I, I'm curious to see that price. Uh, I don't know. I I think Rune is gonna like I. Rune's the two-time defending champ here. True. I mean, I don't think he's gonna like it if it's snowing. So like. This is my whole issue with the event, right? Is like legitimate. This is why I, I have no plays here. Okay. Because on the tennis, there are three really good tennis players here. Rune, Zverev, and Fritz. Okay, I'm not counting Fritz, but yeah, okay, fine. I mean, I don't, I think that's just, okay. you. I, I don't know, like, but again, like I just told you the stats. Like I think he's actually Okay, not, all right, that's fine, that's fine. I'm saying, I'm not saying he's top 10 or even top 20, but I think he's, he's some like, I don't know, some sort of viable player. There's at least Rune and Zverev, who are top 10 guys on clay. You've got two top 10 players yes. in this event. And, but like, who knows what their motivation level is going to be, but, but, but based on the weather. But if the weather's fine, then they'll probably both be motivated. And like, then, then one of them should win the event for sure. So I, I just like, I can't like, I can't back somebody in that situation. Okay, it's, I, it's, just, it's, it's it's probably more of a me thing, but like, I'm not gonna like bet on the weather here one way or the other. Like, like I I I can't really get behind Struff unless you're betting on the weather, and like, just because like he probably I'm also betting on motivation. Like, I think he's gonna probably be the the most motivated guy in the draw. But that partially plays into the weather, right? Like, so you think Rune's not gonna be motivated here of being a two time defending champ? Zverev's a two-time champ also. I mean, I, I I would hesitate to say that they either of them, but they might not be motivated if the weather's bad, but they might be motivated. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. I just, uh, like, I could trust that Stroop will be fully motivated at any point in this tournament. 
right? And the fact that I'm also getting 14 to one, and I personally think he's the third best guy in the draw. He like Fritz and him are like really close in my opinion, but like, I, I don't know. I, I think like, I think he's probably the third or fourth best guy in this draw. It's just me. I mean, we if we disagree, it's it's good. Yeah, I just I I really can't. I mean, Struve has been Struve has not been good all year. He should have gotten smashed by Baez. Somehow he came back and won that match. Like I don't know. I'm, I'm I I I can't see anything positive about Struve <clears throat> since I mean, pretty much literally since Madrid last year. I mean, actually, getting to three and four versus Sinner is actually a decent result. <laughs> you know, like, I don't think he okay. played poorly against Sinner. It's okay. It's okay. He got to four and two. He, lost, he won six games. I don't, I mean, I'm not getting Probably four and two, right. I'm not getting that excited about winning six games against anybody. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I'm not, I mean. Okay. Like, I, I, I really, like, yeah, I really can't get. I think oh, he any should be, he has done. I mean, what like another reason why I like the fourteen to one is I think he should be ahead of Draper and ahead of FAA. You could probably you probably agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that, but I I can't like the the problem I have in any event like this is that like yeah so, to me it's just a disaster because like you're betting on the weather like you're you're I'm, literally you're betting you're betting on the weather and like no matter what you do you're betting on the weather. Yeah. So the only way to not bet on the weather in this event is to not bet the event. And so I, I, I'm just not betting. <laughs> like, fair enough. It's not even a principal thing. It's even like if you look at it, I just don't see like, don't see anything to back. I mean, the unseated finalist at plus 115 could be interesting. Um, I'm trying to look. But there haven't been a whole lot of unseated finalists here. There have been a few. Maybe not. I don't know. It's was uh, VDZ un, uh, unseated last year. Yeah, he was the eight seed. No, he's the four oh. seed actually. Right. Bolelli's been a finalist here back in 08. Simone Bolelli, Eugenie was a finalist. Um, Cole Schreiber's won this event three times. Interesting. He was yeah. a good player. Garin won this event as an unseated as an unseated player. Um. I mean, look, I get it. Like, I think if you had to pick somebody in the draw, to be honest, if, if you had to pick somebody, like if you had a gun to head, if I had to pick somebody, it might actually be Struve. It might be Struve or, um, or Hoffman, but I like, mm -hmm. cause they're two Germans to your point, like at least should be motivated. Yeah. But I, I don't see why. I, I, I get it. Germans. I get it too. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Let's go to individual matches here. Oh, huh. No game spreads or anything. Uh, strange. But uh, first match is uh, Vit Kopriva and Jack Draper. Uh, Vit is plus 400. Draper is minus 550. Uh, last I checked, it was like a, on another book. It, the over-under was 20 and a half, and Draper was like a four and a half game favorite. Um, I like the under here. Under 20 and a half? Yeah. I like the uh uh two two zero here Draper at um like as a parlay piece. I don't think physicality is going to be a problem here. Granted, it's the first match of the tournament. I actually so. think it could be it could be a problem in a different way. And I have no idea what the range you think you have no idea what the range is going to end up looking like. But if there's like multiple rain events in the same day and they bring these guys out and then put them back in the locker room and pull them out again. That seems like a bad thing for Draper. Um, so there's that. Um, trying to look at Coprava. Yeah, but it's cool. I'm not worried about Draper gassing. I'm worried about him pulling a muscle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, retirement is always in play with Draper. Like,
And if this does, I mean, who knows what the rain's going to be like tomorrow. They should be able to get on at some point. I hear you, but if they can't, this could be a mess. Like, Yeah, it's like there's rain scheduled from 11 to 2. It's like 40 to 50% chance, and then it becomes cloudy. And then Well, it's like 100% rain. chance from 11 to 1. Yeah, so it's probably going to be delayed initially, right? So they might get on around like 2 o'clock, and then it's like cloudy, but it's super windy. The weather is just a total disaster. <laughs> yeah. So I get it, but from to me, from a tennis perspective, just just the pure tennis, like Draper, is so much better. But four and a half games is a lot of games. Yeah, I, I don't. In two zero at minus one eighty five, that's not a great price for a two zero. Um, I don't like taking the under almost. Well, that's that's even harder than the two zero, right? But I guess you're getting a slightly better price is the advantage. Um. Koprova's played five top 50 guys in his career. He's taken a set three times. Uh, any of them on clay? Two of them. Versus who? Chapo and Pear. But Chapo was top 10 in the world when he took a set from him. That was like when Chapo was playing at his best. Okay, I'll count that one. Not not Pear. I get it, but he also took a set. I mean, the, the Australian, he took two sets from Korda. And yeah, that was probably bad Korda more than good Vit, but... Yeah, I mean, at that Korda can drop a set to anyone. He can. So. But can't, I mean, I don't know. I... Uh, I'll probably end up staying away. It, 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 anyway. Yeah. Right. Uh, I next... get it. Like, I think, I don't know. I think... um. Like, I hear you that Draper's a lot better player. All right, next match, yeah. let's move on. Uh, Moro Kanyas against Dominic Team. Uh, Moro Kanyas is plus 165 on the money line. Team is minus 200. Uh, I'm, on a, I'm on a hard Dami Team fade. Uh, I'm going to bet Moro Kanyas plus 165. I know nothing about Moro Kanyas, so I need to learn a little bit more about him before I make any bet there. Um, He qualified. Who would he be? This qualifier was pretty bad, wasn't yeah, it? Masur and Fadik. I've never, I don't even know who is Fadik. I think I've heard of him once or twice. See, I've seen him his name in a draw, but he lost to Shang in the uh, Madrid Challenger. Lost to Gokov. Yeah, I mean, not great. He beat ARV in the. Jerusalem His ranking is two thirty eight in the world. I mean, that's why he's plus one sixty five, but like. Team doesn't win matches now. Like, and I think he has some kind of wrist thing. I mean, yeah, he's talked about having to retire. You know, he's talking, talking, he's talking about having to figure out when he, he lost retire. one and two to RBA, like in Monte Carlo. Like, that's really bad. It is. It is. I mean, like, it has not been good for team. It's, it's, I, yeah, I, it's I, I, like, I have trouble to believe that team can, like, get through a match like he can get through a match but like not playing well like I, I think the wrist is really bothering him so to me the injury concern plus the fact that Morokanya is qualified and has two matches under his belt in these conditions like that's good enough for me take the plus 165 I'm not like saying Morokanya is like anything great it's it's just more a fade on team Just plus, like a lot of built in, man. Like if plus he, it's if heavy, were... heavy conditions, right? Where it, it's going to be harder for a team to get some added pace, right? With if he's if he indeed has a wrist problem. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. This is this is. I'll probably end up staying away from this too. I I have a hard time getting excited about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And like I just feel like like the the, the fate on team has to be built into that. Because minus two one, like if 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 you were thinking the team was an ATP level player, this would be way further out than minus two hundred. You know, it'd be like minus four hundred or something. Yeah, you're probably right. Probably right. I I can't trust team to win any matches now. 
Well, that's why I'd probably stay away, right? Yeah. I don't have to trust. I don't have to trust either person. Yeah. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, bets of the, the day: R- Redberg against Michelson. Why Michelson shouldn't be a minus two fifty favorite against anyone on the clay court. Um, I would uh, if Redberg to win a set. I mean, it's it's a bit juiced, so I'm probably just going to take the money line. But like Michelson looked lost on clay in Houston. And that's a different clay. That's more like a hard true clay. Like this, this is a different surface. He just has no experience on the surface. Yeah. Um, so minus 250 is way too short, in my opinion. Um, are you are you on it with me? Like I like the Redberg set one money line, basically any Redberg line, pro Redberg line. I wouldn't mind here. I think Michelson is way overvalued. Yeah, probably. I'll, I'll probably hit Rayburg with you here. Okay. When is this match tomorrow? It's I, I'll let you know in the morning if it's GBM worthy, but I'll probably be on Rayburg. I also like the Rayburg 2-1. At plus five hundred, if you're gonna do that, that dog. Um, I wouldn't do that. I mean, if Michaelson's that lost, it could be two nil. Could be. Yeah, I, I think just the Redberg money line is probably the best. Plus two hundred. Yeah. I mean, did you see Sal Michaelson's match um, against? Who was it in Houston? I don't even remember. Oh, Purcell. And then in Monte Carlo, he lost one and three to Mute. Yeah, I mean that's that's not good. That's not what I want to see. No, it's not. It's not. And so, uh, is, is German, so he's gonna be pumped up for this match. It's just that like so if we're talking about Rayburg, Rayburg is I yeah. mean, no, he's he's ranked 479 in the world. Yeah. He plays mostly futures. Like, I, I got to look a lot more at this guy because I got to understand, like, is this guy even, like, 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 again, it's built into the line. That's the problem, right? Like, if if these guys were playing on, on a, a service where Michaelson had any experience, experience he'd probably be it wouldn't look like this. Favorite. What? If, if this was on hard, he'd be minus six, seven, 600 probably. Exactly. So it's like, have they baked in enough? I don't know. I don't think they have, which is why I'm hitting it. But like Michaelson just looks like lost. Like I, he just doesn't know how to move on it. Like his footing is so bad. He's off balance on every ground stroke. <laughs> okay. That that was my takeaway from what I saw a little bit of the match against Mute. And the yeah. match against Purcell. Like all right. He beat Purcell, right? No, he lost. Okay. Yeah. If you're losing to Purcell on clay, where did he play Mute? Monte oh, Pro- did he get a lucky loser in? Was that was Purcell? No, I was in qualies. Okay. Yeah. All right, Pissarro and Moliker. Uh, I don't really know these guys, so I I'm I'm not playing this. But uh, I got I got to do some tape study here. What was that? I got to do some tape study here. Do some research. I haven't gotten a chance to research these matches. Okay. Shevchenko and Hoffman. Um, Hoffman minus 145, Shevchenko plus 120. I'll probably play Hoffman in some capacity. It's what that's probably going to be like a one and a half game spread. Yeah. I'm tempted to take Shevchenko. Really? But I got to think about it. But I'm tempted. It's probably close. Like, I think these guys are actually pretty similar on on clay. Really? So Shevchenko's lost two and one to Berrettini in Marrakech, and then he lost two and four to Coria in Monte Carlo. It's not really a guy I want to back, especially a guy against a German who likes says he likes this tournament. <laughs> Yeah, but he was okay last year on clay. 
he was uh, he's just in a bad way. He plays better in clay altitude. Like most of his good results last year on clay were were in Madrid. That's true. That's true. It, well, it helps the serve and how he get he's the points are a little shorter. But the same thing can be true of Hoffman. And this yeah, is there altitude. is a little altitude here. That's this true. is altitude. It's just the problem is going to be it's going to be crappy conditions. Um, I think Hoffman is going to be happier to be there though. Like, and if this is stop start match, like I, I think Hoffman is going to be like, okay, I'm I'm here in my home country, like I'll deal with it. Whereas Shevchenko's like, oh, I want to get to Madrid. I'm going to stay away. Okay. Like if I was like. I like like my rule with that is usually like if, if it's like a tie if I'm like borderline on a guy I might do it because of that like I was borderline on Shevchenko but you convinced me to stay away from Shevchenko that's a good call out all right uh Ugo Carbelli against Galan <laughs> kind of like Galan I think but I need to think about this, this is what I, I need to spend some time with. Seems about right, to be honest. Garin at minus 120 against Kofor seems amazing at first glance. Garin, I, I talked about it last time, and then he went out and lost in three sets to Hebrew, which isn't a terrible result. Yeah, it's not like, terrible. Garin said he's feeling better physically for the first time in a while. If that's really true, I think he's a much better play quarter than, than Kofor. Hasn't Garin won this tournament? He has. And then Kofor lost in three sets to Greek Spore. He lost uh, straight sets to Lamas Ruiz. Kofor is not exactly a good clay court player. Like, I think he also struggled. He's another guy that struggles to move on the surface. Yeah, he seems to do better on slow hard. Yeah. So clay actually he had some uh challenger success on clay he won in prague and Turin last year or he made the final in in prague and then won Turin. yeah it's close for me it's close maybe i won't hit it i don't know i might end up staying away but i do think Irene. man i don't know i think Irene is it is at home for Kopfer, but I don't know. I think Green, like if Green actually is physically decent, he's like Green has well inside the top hundred talent on clay, probably top fifty. At one point, Green was top twenty in the world, wasn't he? He was. He was. So that's my initial thought. Yeah, but yeah, there's a lot I gotta look into here. We have a day to think about it. Yeah. Uh, F.A. and Martyrer. Um, I really like uh, the here. I'm on a Martyrer fade. He's he's been awful this year. And F.A.A. has been better in first matches this year. He's actually been worse in the second match. Yeah, Martyr has won. Three matches all year. One to Elias Yemer, one to Van Ash, and one to Earl. Yeah, but he's won four of his last ten. Or three. Yeah, he's won he's won four matches this year. He's won four of his last ten. Emer, Errol, Van Ash, and Emer twice. Yeah, that's, that's last that time. I think he's power. slowly coming out of it. I don't think it's good by any means. I'm not saying that's something you're excited about, but I don't know. I think he's getting back to like his, I don't know, his normal mediocre self. So minus F3. 325 seems long on FA on clay at this for point. Sure. For sure. Yeah, it might be just be a stay away. Um, but FAA has like in his last couple of tournaments, he's 
won the first match and then flamed out. So he beat Les Yen and then flamed out to uh, Alcaraz in Indian Wells, beat Walton and then flamed out to Zverev in Miami, uh, beat Nardi and then flamed out to Sonigo in Indian Wells, or in um, in Monte Carlo. Matt, do you think that might be because those, the guys he beat are worse and the guys he lost to are better? Well, Sonigo, not really. Uh, Sonigo is better than the guys he beat. Yeah, he's better than, better than Nardi. That's true. I mean, Zverev and uh, Alcaraz. Yeah, okay, whatever. I just think, I just think, I think, like, I don't know. My opinion on FA is that he's just like a, he's like just another dude at this point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, on, on Indoor Hard, he's a little better because of the serve, but on, um, but on Clay, I don't, I actually might go for Martyr here. Yeah, I, I probably will. I don't think Martyr is that. Really? I, I think Martyr should be a dog, to be clear, but I don't think Martyr is really that bad. Like, I think he's like. When the only guy you're beating on player, is maybe Elias like 100 to 150. And FA is probably somewhere between like 50 and 80. And given those where those two are, I don't think it should be plus 260. Like. I have to disagree. I, I think Martyr is kind of on the same level as those guys that FA was was beating like pretty easily. Like he's like kind of on Luca Nardi level. I agree with that, but I don't think the standard result if FA plays Luca Luca Nardi level guys is FA beating them two and three or beating them every time. Like Lashen is a completely different animal. I don't think you can count that. Yeah, okay. Walton is well below. Cressy's a completely different animal. Hollies, I don't even know what to think about that. I'd put, I'd put, uh, what's his name? I'd put, um, I'd still probably put Martyr above Mayo. Mayo's, I'm mean, not a Mayo guy. Um, and then you get, and you're getting into like indoor hard and like quick hard. I, I don't like if this was on indoor hard. Yeah, that's probably close to a fair line. But on clay, I, I think this is closer. I don't think so. I'm a I'm I'm slightly higher on FAA than you are. I mean, where do you on clay? Yeah, I well maybe I, let me say say it differently. I'm I'm lower on martyr. So like, if you had to put power rank put martyr. Huh? If you had to put power rankings together, where would you put mart martyr? Like where would I rank him? Yeah. On clay, probably between like 125 and 150. Okay. And where would you put FAA? Probably between 40 and 60. Okay. So then you're higher on FAA. I can't. I, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit. A little bit. I, mean, I put FAA probably down in the 70, 80 range. I can't. I can't. Okay. I mean, he hasn't done since that injury, he hasn't done anything on clay, anything really on anything that's been. Even a slow hardcore, he hasn't done anything of no. Yeah, I'm not saying it's it's been good, but I don't. I'm I'm really low on martyr. I I don't I don't like what I've seen from him. Um, all right, next match: Rodionov and Vukic. Um, so <laughs> do you think uh, FAA is better than Vukic at this point? I think they're pretty even. Really? Wow, you're really clay, on clay. Vukic has been playing better on the clay, man. He has. That's why I made. That's why I asked you the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm inclined to back Vukic in some capacity here in this match. That's gotta think about first glance. That's what I'm thinking. I think this is pretty well set. Like I think. Like, Vukic is a better player, but the line's telling you that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Taro Daniel and uh, Chris O'Connell. Um, so I, I looked at this match. I was thinking about it. On first glance, I was thinking about playing the O'Connell minus two and a half. Um, but then I looked and I was like, I was curious about Daniel's results on clay, and he actually beat O'Connell at Roland Garros last year. Love two and 
three or something like yes, that. Yes, he did destroy O'Connell. But then the, I, when I saw that, I was like, I'm going to stay away. And I think O'Connell likes these conditions, like like likes these like slow kind of damp conditions and altitude. Um, but because of that French Open win, I I, I have to stay away here. I'm staying away, but just I think O'Connell's better, but it's it's I think this line is pretty well set. Again, the line's telling you he's better. I mm -hmm. think he's probably two and a half to three games better. Okay. Gokov and VDZ. Uh Gokov is a plus four fifty dog. VDZ is minus six fifty. I'm I'm staying away here. I I I can't. Although plus four fifty is getting to the point where it might be worth taking a stab at Gokov. Any thoughts here? Um, I want to see more lines here. Like, I don't know if the money line is the right way to play this match. Yeah. Like, I'd like to, like, what's an over under? I'm assuming it's with this line, it's probably going to be probably like 20. 20, 21, 20, 21. I mean, if it's 20, I'm, the over is probably actually a decent play. I feel like VDZ has so many question marks. Like he withdrew after five games against Munar. Yeah, I was thinking about getting with Gakov. Or the under and just hoping that like if VDC either VDZ wins easily or uh if he gets down, he just gets down on himself and just, you know, it goes the wrong way. way. Yeah. I mean, VDZ does play. But Gakov to win a set's going to be like plus 150. The set one money line on Gakov is 300. I don't really need to shorten the finish line. I don't know. I, I got to look at this match a lot more. I got to look at all these matches, but Gakov could be interesting here. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I don't, at that price, I would never, ever back VDZ, especially like given. He's not somebody I love to back as a big favorite. I agree. No. I mean, he just played Munar and withdrew after five games. Yeah. So that could that could mean a lot of things, you know. Um, and then Husler and Topo. I have no read on this. Have you seen well, Mark Husler's in a draw? Did he qualify? Yeah. It's the first time he's been in an ATP tour in a while, draw in a while. He's been like you no, know, he had he got his ranking up for a while. He did really didn't he do really well at Winston Salem in twenty twenty two? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh He screwed me on an under parlay today in qualifying. I was watching that Chwinski Husler match and he had multiple break points to go up two breaks in the second. And of course choked it. So All right, so that does it for Munich. Uh, and no GBM plays here, right? It's tough. There's no spreads. There's only four matches tomorrow. I need to look at all these matches. Yeah. Like, Oh, maybe yeah. the Reberg, right? Yeah, maybe the Reberg. Yeah. But um, yeah, we had some disagreements here. Yeah. Again, I got to look more at these matches. I just don't like it. And these matches require research. There's a lot of guys. It's a really, It's kind of a weak draw. It is. It is. All right, let's go over the uh, draw in uh, Bucharest. Yeah, I don't even did. Did they even play this tournament last year? I feel like they keep moving this tournament around between places. They do. I think this tournament existed a while back. It did. It existed through twenty sixteen. They brought it back now. Um, but, but I don't know nothing about what they're doing with this. I don't know if it's even the same surface, the same actual place. But we don't know about the court. That's what I'm saying. So it's it's hard to it's hard to bet futures if you don't know the court. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a clay court. You yeah. know, it's some sort of outdoor clay court. Is there so altitude crests? What? There's minimal, like a hundred, less than a hundred meters. Okay. The weather is supposed to be like hot in the beginning of the week, and then yeah, hot Monday, Tuesday, and then cooling down significantly. Um, and then rain Wednesday, Thursday, potentially winds throughout the week. Yeah, feels like. There's just like this storm system going through through Europe this week. There is. That's what it is. There is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um top top half of the draw, we got Sarindolo as the number one seed. He'll play the winner of Gasquet and Coria. Then we got Luca Nardi and Seaboth Wilch. Um oh the first time he's back since the since we saw him in Miami. Yeah. Um the winner of that will play Dardari or Mar uh, uh, Mariana Devoni. Um, I don't think they have quarter prices on this, right? No, not yet. Do not. Okay. So we'll just go over the draws of, as a whole. Uh, Kord is the number three seed. He'll play uh, the winner of a qualifier, Kokonakis. Gofan will play Ketchmanovic. Um, The winner of yeah, Gofan Ketchmanovic will play... Um, either a qualifier or Pedro Martinez. They must have placed the qualifiers by now. Go to the printout draw. They must have placed them. I think they played the qual second round of qualifiers today, didn't they? No, they still have some round two uh, qualifiers. Oh, they do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They just scheduled it differently. Okay. That's probably why they don't have quarter prices, honestly. That's 100% why they don't have quarter prices. Yeah. Do they even... How many <laughs> matches do they play for round one tomorrow? I think four, and then they, fin they have some... Uh, Qualifiers, well, the outer courts. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. They have, yeah. Wow. Okay. And then Sonigo will play Fonseca. Um, winner of that will play a qualifier, Kope Savage. Gaston Rinderneck. And the winner of that will play Tabilo. And then in the last quarter, we got Borges and Bavrinka, Mute Shapovalov, qualifier and Fushevic, and Greekspor. So I have one outright pick here. Um, it's it's tough, um, but it's t it's Tabilo at eleven to one, and it's not a high confidence pick. It's it's like half half a unit or three quarters of a unit. Um, but he's had a good year, and he's um, he's proven he could win a two fifty. He's done it already this year. And I just can't trust anyone else in this draw. Like, for me, if I look at this draw as a whole, like, Tabilo is probably the most trustworthy guy in terms of, like, I know what I'm going to get with him. You know what I mean? Yeah, you only need to win four matches. Right, that too. I like him better on Clay. I mean, I think he's the best play guy in, the, in, the, in that in the bottom half of the draw for sure who's the top seed Sarundalo I mean he's not as good as Sarundalo but but Sarundalo is so like he could be really good but he can also be atrocious right well but is that really true like before this year that really was I mean before this year that wasn't really true on clay yeah that's true and even and even this year on clay right who did he lose to Kachanov Kachanov yeah like, that's not bad. In and that was a three setter, right? Miami. Well, what I also like is that he's on the bottom, Tabilo's on the bottom half of the draw, where I think there are less dangerous players than the top half. Like, um... like in the top half, you have Corda, you got Martinez, who's in good form. Um you have Navoni, you got Dardari, you got Sarindolo. So, like, they're more dangerous guys in the top half. But I he, don't know. I mean, you got Sinego, Fonseca in the bottom half. Fonseca. Um, what? Fonseca, I have no no concerns about. Okay. For just or Pavrinka. I mean, Pavrinka, there's fitness issues, but if he somehow gets through. Yeah. 
The bottom quarter. I mean, yeah, I don't know. That bottom quarter. I mean, Nuno could actually be kind of. Uh, what is the price on Nuno? To win a tournament? Yeah. Sixteen to one. Probably prefer it to be low eleven to one. It's one less match, if nothing yeah. else. But that fourth quarter is really weak. It is. I mean, honestly, it's not a great draw. That's what happens when they play a 250, two two fifties and five hundred in the same week. It's not, but like I, I think Tabilo's in the weaker half, and he's only going to have to play one of those guys in the top half. Like, and I think his quarter is pretty weak, honestly. Sonigo's always scary. Yeah. But yeah, um, I don't know. I like the Tabilo eleven to one, like. And I might actually hedge with top half to win the to win at minus one fifteen. I might actually do that as like a mini hedge. Yeah, can you go back to the draw? Mm -hmm. Can you go to the bottom half? Uh -huh. I'm thinking about this to be low. I might actually get on this with you. Like, besides Sonigo, what guy does he lose to? Borges. Yeah, but that's that that would be in the semis. Yeah, in his quarter, in his quarter, I mean, I don't know if Tavilo's yet entered, like, a circle of trust where, like, I'm going to say he couldn't lose to Gaston Rinder. I don't think he will, but I think he's probably 70% likely to win that match. I think Senegor Fonseca is a little better than coin flip, but not that much. Um... Like, I think he's probably 40% good to win the quarter. Mm -hmm. And then is he one out of four to win the event if he wins the quarter? I mean, he's definitely a favorite against anybody in that in that bottom in the bottom quarter. I think Borges is really the only guy. I don't trust Greek Sport all on play. No, but Mutet's playing better. Mutet could be scary. What is Mutet's price? Are you serious right now? Yeah. <laughs> Only twenty. No, that's not interesting. I was, I was thinking you'd get like some kind of ridiculous price on. Oh, like eighty to one? No, Gasquet is forty to one. What about like Navoni sitting down there at thirty three? It's tough because the first round is really tough for him. Who is it? Nardari. That's not that tough. It's not tough, but then you have to play Nardi or Seabock Wilch. Then you have to play Sarindlo. Then you have to play Corda. Then like that's a that's a tough road. Well, yeah, I mean, if Sarindal and Quarter both win, sure. But, like, there's no – I mean, with Quarter, there's no guarantee of anything. No guarantee. But Kokonakis just is – he just won a Sarasota Challenger in Florida. So, that's a bad travel spot for him. It is. It I'm is. probably going to back that qualifier, honestly. Yeah, I would, too. That's a tough travel spot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I got to think a lot more about this. But I think the initial thought on Tabilo makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I definitely think he's good to make the final, like, probably as much as 20 to 25% of the time somewhere in there. Okay. And if he, you know, and then the question is, is he 50-50 or is he, like, 45% against the winner of the top half? Maybe. I mean, is, is he is anybody better than him in that top half except Dolo? Corda. Yeah, but I don't think Corda is that much better. I think he's very – like, if he plays Corda, like – I think Dar I think I think um Bilo's definitely live there. I also yeah. think Corda could lose to like he could lose to a Ketchmanovic, he could lose to a Pedro Martinez. Like there there are obstacles for him before that match. He could lose to Kokonakis. I mean he probably won't do the travel spot. That's a good call out, but he could lose to Kokonakis. Yeah. Um and then that top quarter is honestly pretty tough. Like I could see a lot of different guys advancing there. Um, all of which, if it's not Sarundolo, then I think to be a favorite there too. Um, Agreed. I'll probably get behind that eleven to one on Tableau. That sounds pretty good at first glance. Okay. I gotta look at the draw though a lot more. Dolo at seven to one seems pretty good though too. I mean, honestly, like, 
is he really like yeah uh, I don't know. He's he's a tough guy to back. Like some that some weeks you get a good dolo. And no, then... but why? But but okay. You got to separate him from different surfaces on clay. When do you get bad dolo? True. I mean, you got bad what dolo. Was lost last year was Kachin in Madrid. That's not bad. Do, uh Golden Swing. He did bad. This year? This year's I don't care. This year he had like food poisoning or some shit. Okay. He does seem to not do well in Golden Swing, but European clay he seems to do well in. That is true. That is true. Yeah, he seems to be getting it back to some extent. That Which might makes be a sense. Good if he had if he had food poisoning, then that would it took him a few weeks to like recover. And get back into like full playing yeah. shape. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are the two only two guys I really catch my eye. Like that, that I would even consider. I prefer that to be low eleven to one, but you make good points on Serena Low. I'll probably back both. Both? Okay. Nuno, I would love to get behind Nuno, but I just don't like the price. Um, Mutet, the same thing. I think Mutet would be a really nice, like, fun, sneaky pick, but not at 20 to 1. No. Corey at 25? Probably not. You'd probably want a little more altitude. Something to help him out. Fushevik, you can back him in the first out. round. What? Fushevik, you can back him in the first round. You can't back him in to, to, to win an event. No. Yeah. All right, let's go over the uh individual matches here. So um Chapo and Corinthe Mute. Uh Chapo's even money. That seems like an under spot to me. Mute and Chapo. I feel like Chapo's played a whole ton of three set matches this year, hasn't he? Let me look it up. He just recently lost to Girone in Houston, two and five. Then he lost three and six to Arnaldi. We saw Who that. Who watched that match? Yep. Uh, he lost two and four, to, or he beat Sissy Pass two and four. And then he, he won three against Ardari. In Indian Wells, he won three against Musetti, but then beat VDZ one four. So it's it's a mix. Yeah, I don't I don't know if like you would think that Shappa would be like, oh, I flip shit and then I just like blow the match, but like, and sometimes he's like that, but sometimes he just flips shit and then he comes back and plays okay tennis again. Now both guys do that here. Like, didn't he break a racket against uh against you know what i kind of like here i kind of like the three sets here at plus 125 well the problem is it's like an even money match yeah maybe i might take a three sets here or an over games i I can't trust these guys to go over games like they they could be chapeau doesn't change his tactics and then Mute can just like go completely mentally. And maybe you know, then maybe three sets. You might be right. Maybe three sets. Okay. All right. I'm not I'm not backing that with you. Who are you on anything there? It's probably under or pass to me. Okay. I just think it's like it's I think that's like an easy thing to say, oh, these guys are mentally immature, so they're gonna go under, but I don't know if that's the case in this case. Like I, don't, I, I think it's like with Shapo, like it happens sometimes, but I don't think it's like he all like like I feel like he just flips shit, but then he like is actually still like able to find his game enough. To, but Mute to... actually moves pretty well, and like he's crafty and does weird things, and like Shapo is not going to be able to adjust to that if he if he's like down big, like wins loses the first set, and then if Shapo wins a tight first set or anything like that, then I think Mute is just going to go away. From a mental perspective, so I, I I don't I don't think either of these guys have the mental capacity to rebound after losing a first set. Um, 
I don't know. Shapo did it against Murray. Did it against Bublik. I don't know he didn't do it against Bublik. He did it against Murray. No, he didn't do it against Murray either. I guess I guess you're right. Maybe he can't. Maybe he doesn't have enough. I don't know. You might be right. It's not that he changes tactics. It's just like if he plays better and the other guy plays worse, it could happen. But yeah, I, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't. Uh... Yeah. All right, Gofen and uh, Kachmanovic. Um, oh, ew. I just, you know, Kachmanovic is one of those guys I just stay away from now. I, I, I don't touch his matches. I, you had a great call with him against uh, Berrettini last week. That was that was a fantastic bet. Yeah, I don't know if this is a spot to to play him. I agree. Okay. This this to me looks like stay away at first glance. I got again. I have to look at all these lines more, but this it's at first glance to stay away. Uh, Gaston and Rinderneck. Um, a lot of people are in Gaston here. I mean, on paper, it feels like it's a good matchup, but like Gaston has been really bad recently. He lost in Monte Carlo to Hoffman. And then he lost to Fonini in Marrakech. Lost to Wong in Miami in Qualies. Lost to Berrettini in the Phoenix Challenger. Lost to Kudla 1-3 and three in Indian Wells. He's lost his last six. I mean, that's all we need to say. Yeah. And none of them are top 100. Only, the only one is a top 100 player. I guess I guess Hoffman is theoretically a top 100 player, but it's mostly because of his altitude work in clay. And then Fognini is theoretically top 100. He's the top ranked 100. Um, it's not ideal, but Rinderneck's not great either. I'm kind of tempted to back a stone, man. I kind of, I'm kind of tempted to read it's, It wouldn't be because I have any faith whatsoever in Gaston. It would just be because I'm not even sure Rinder next a top hundred player on clay. He's just so, he so yeah. much needs that serve. Right. Now most people are on Twitter are on Gaston, especially at plus money. It's just I, I can't get there just because of losing the last six matches, and like he's brutal to bet on to begin with. So you you add those two things together, and it's like I I understand on paper this this should be a good matchup, especially on clay. But like, no, thank you. I'm not getting involved in this. What are the under nine and a half in set one? That's probably a decent look, plus one hundred five. But the thing is, Rinderneck does have a decent serve, right? Yeah, yeah. And like I think in their uh and the bet rivers guys mentioned this in their previous matchups like gaston has been hold he held serve quite quite a high percentage of time because like rinderneck is just such a bad returner yeah you're right it might be actually more of an over nine and a half in the first set but it's juiced so i don't want that either. yeah i mean it's only minus 135 all right next match sonigo against Fonseca. this should be an entertaining match actually um what about three sets here Three sets seems decent. Plus one forty. That seems decent. Yeah. But what has Fonseca done since coming over to Europe? I know he lost to Choinsky in three sets. In lost Estero. to Choinsky in three sets. Beat Andreozzi and Mayo. Lost to Righty. I mean, honestly, it's not terrible. I mean, I kind of like three sets here at first glance. I think is is probably like, but like Sonic can goes... lose a set to anyone. <laughs> yeah, and folks say he can win a set from anyone. Yeah, he could. You can also like, friend. these are yeah. two super erratic guys. And like, look at Fonseca also in that uh, challenger that he played in Asuncion. He went three against Haide. Burchaga and lose. He went three against Choinsky, and then he went three twice in the Madrid Challenger. Yeah. So he competes for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think a three sets here is probably what I'll play. I agree. All right, Nardi against Seaboth Wilch. Ugh. For me, this is a pass. 
maybe the under 22 and a half, but like, I, I don't know what to expect from Seabock Welch coming off the surface transition. Um, and I actually think hardcore is better for Nardi. Like I saw some of that match against FAA. He, he looked really bad. Do you agree? Still tempted to play Nardi here. Some of feels just a little bit. I got to think about it more, but I'm tempted to play Nardi. Nardi. Both Wilch can be a little all over the place. I, I, Nardi might be good. I mean, but it's only plus 120, so probably not. It's kind of a weak money line. It's it's probably a pass for me. Okay. Uh, Dardari and Navoni. Uh, I'm all over Dardari money line at minus 130. Probably going to pass this, but it's close for me. I don't love Dard. I think I like Dardari more at altitude or on faster play. This is probably a little too slow. There's only like 250 feet or something of altitude. They've played twice this year. They played in Buenos Aires, Dardari won two and one. That was pretty slow. Yeah, no, Buenos Aires is definitely slow. I guess Dardari, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. That Dard yeah, I mean, that, that much I'm not as excited about, but like, um, and then you're getting back a year, which they're completely different play or six months. And then, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I gotta think about it more, but at first glance, it's probably a pass. You probably something to do a pass, but I gotta think about it more. Okay, I'm under a dairy money line there. Um, Borges Fabrinko. So, this is probably my favorite play of the, this round. I love the Borges 2 1 at plus 290. Yeah, me too. Me too. We could make that GBM actually. Let's make that GBM. Yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah. Um I like the Borges minus two as well. Just because I feel like Favrinka is gonna gas out at some point. Yeah. Even if it doesn't go three, like <laughs> he can gas out midway through the second, you know. Yeah, it might be. It might be better. You might. Yeah, yeah. I might split my unit there, or I might. Yeah, I might put one unit on each. Yeah, but we're we're aligned there for sure. Uh, yeah. that's a qualifying match. I also love uh in this match. I love Coria minus two and a half against Gasquet. I just think physically, he's just w way fitter and better from a physical perspective. So. The Coria 2 1 is actually a decent look here, too. What is that? 3 to 1? Yeah, about. Plus um, I mean, guess they beat team, but that's that's really it. Yeah, it's tough. You just don't see enough of Korich, like not Korich, Korea. I feel like on European clay. Okay. Like I feel like he does better on South American clay when it's hotter. It's supposed to be pretty warm tomorrow. I'll probably take like like uh. That's it's true. Tomorrow's supposed to be warm. Yeah. It. Yeah, that's that's another thing. The fact that they're playing this match tomorrow. Yeah. I think, right? Let me see if it's scheduled tomorrow. That's a good call out. Yeah, it's tomorrow. So it's gonna yeah. be like hot tomorrow. Yep. Yeah, that's good. That's a good call out. All right, and then uh, the rest are the other two are qualifying matches. Although I like Luca Pui there at minus one forty five against Barrer, on first glance. All right, so that does it. So let's just go over GBM plays quickly. So we got the uh, the Vavrinka, or I'm sorry, the Borges two one right yep. at plus two ninety. Yep. Um, I got the Dardari money line. 
I'm passing on Nardi Seaboth Wilge. You you might be on Nardi money line there. Uh, yeah. Fonseca Sonigo three sets. I don't think that's GBM worthy in my eyes, but we'll be okay. we'll be on it, right? Three sets is risky for GBM. It's like I don't know, it's up to you. We'll we'll think about it. Um, are you gonna play the Gaston money line? Probably, but I gotta think about it. Okay, I'm off that. Uh, I'll be probably on the Mute Chapeau under. Um, so that does it for Bucharest. And you're going to play the, we're both going to play the uh, Tabilo to win at 11 to 1. Yeah, probably. I mean, I need to think about it a little bit more, but I'm, I'm pretty, okay. pretty, pretty. It's sure a one unit. I don't think I'm going to go two units there. Yeah. But, uh, as far as Munich goes, uh, I'm on the Draper 2-0 against Copriva. Um, I'll, that'll probably be a parlay piece for me. I'm on the Moro Canyas plus 165. You're staying away. Yeah. Um, I'm on the Ray. I got to think about all these matches, to be honest. I, I don't have any distinct plays here yet. The thing okay. I'm probably closest on at first glance is Garina minus 120. Okay. Okay. I'm going to be on Hoffman in some capacity here. Um. Yeah, probably Gokov in some capacity as well tomorrow. And then Barcelona, um, we got the Evans set one money line at plus 140. Yep. Is right? that GBM? No. Okay. I can't, I can't back Evans as, as GBM. Uh, yeah. It's a one unit for me. Um, Acosta Rincon, that's that's an underplay for me. Um, Arnaldi Cazzo, I think that's also in my under parlay. I'm on the Roman RBA under 22 and a half. That's a single bet for me. Are you playing that one? Roman money line? Probably. Yeah. There's not a lot of value there, but I'll probably play the Roman money line. Okay. Um, I'm on the Mayo money line at, uh, against Kachin. You're on the under there, right? The yep. set one under? Yep. And I'm on the set one under again on the Muller Ramos Manolas and the Hart Londoluce. Londoluce. Okay. All right. I'm going to be on the Poppy minus two and a half. That's Is that GBM? I gotta think about it. That one's not until well. That's not tomorrow. These those are all yeah. these are all Tuesday matches. Lyavik money line, right? That's you. I'm probably I'm gonna be probably on the uh, on the under there. Um, Kaboli two one at at seven. At, was it nine to one? I think that's that's what I'm gonna go with. You're staying away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. I might be on RCB in some capacity. Got to think about that one more. Um, Munar Yoshi, I'm probably going to be on the under there, under 21 and a half. Uh, we're both on the Zhang money line. That's GBM. Yeah. Against Van Ash. And then the Shang money line at plus 175. So bunch of plays. Bunch of plays, yeah. But a lot of those are Tuesday. Mm-hmm. All right. Any uh, parting shots before we? Oh, the only other thing is I like the um, no one seated finalist in uh, Barcelona at plus one hundred five. No one seated finalist at plus one hundred five. Yeah, like if you look at the unseated players in Barcelona, tell me who makes the final. Yeah, that that's a good like anti Nadal bet. Right, that's the only reason that one's where it is at. Right, like it's literally like you're basically playing like an anti Nadal. It's a good way to fade Nadal, actually. Yeah, it's actually really the only way I can think of to fade Nadal in this tournament because, like I said, I thought Q two is a pretty tough quarter. I like that. What's the price on that? Um, plus one hundred five. I'll I'll back you on that. We can make that GBM if you want. Nice. Do that. Beautiful. All right. So uh that does it for this megapod. Um, best of luck on the bets. Enjoy the week of tennis, and uh, we'll be probably back midweek. All right, everyone. Thanks again for following, liking, watching, yada yada. All right, see you guys later. Bye.